Hey everyone, welcome to another Iceberg. Today, I'll be finishing up the DC Trinity with Wonder Woman. Although, like with my other superhero icebergs, this isn't just going to be about Wonder Woman. I'm also going to be including topics relating to her supporting cast of characters, like the various different Wonder Girls and Steve Trevor, alongside her various villains like Ares and Cheetah. As always, if you like the video, drop a like and a comment. Maybe tell me your favorite Wonder Woman storyline or villain. Do you like Gal Gadot's portrayal as Wonder Woman? Subscribe if you want more iceberg content, because I got a bunch more superhero icebergs in the works, like ones based around Daredevil, the X-Men, Green Lantern, Captain America, Hulk, and the DCEU. And I already got some superhero icebergs made, like Batman, Superman, Iron Man, Spider-Man, The Flash, and the MCU. Also got icebergs about other nerdy stuff, like the Alien and Predator franchises, Godzilla, Star Wars, Halo, Mass Effect, Lego, Evangelion, etc. With all of that out of the way, let's begin. Cancelled 2009 Sequel Based on George Perez's time writing the character, Wonder Woman 2009 was directed by Lord Montgomery and received an extremely positive reception. This film was also the very first Wonder Woman solo project since the ending of the 1975 Linda Carter series, which ended in 1979. Despite its popularity with fans, it never got a sequel. But it was supposed to. In April 2010, Bruce Timm, who produced the film, explained in an interview that the film was supposed to receive multiple sequels, but these plans would be cancelled because of the film's slow sales. Not that it had poor sales, as the film eventually made its money back, but it wasn't quick enough for Warner Bros. Now before someone says this film did receive a sequel in 2019, Wonder Woman Bloodlines isn't a sequel, as that film takes place in the DC animated film universe, while the 2009 film takes place in its own separate continuity. Wonder Woman 1974 Released on March 12, 1974 and starring Kathy Lee Crosby, Wonder Woman was a made-for-TV film that aired on ABC in 1974. Technically, it's the very first Wonder Woman film, However, it's also not really a Wonder Woman film. Despite it being about Diana Prince, the film made a ton of creative changes. From small changes like Wonder Woman now being a blonde, to major changes like her now being a James Bond-like super spy assistant to Steve Trevor. She also doesn't have any powers as this version of the character was inspired by the period of time where she lost her powers in the comics. More on that in a little bit. So, was this film a success? Not really. It did get decent ratings, but not enough for ABC to want to make an entire show based around it. Because of its obscurity, this version of Wonder Woman hasn't really gotten the fanfare that other older superhero media has gotten, like the 60s Batman series, the original Superman film series, and even the 1975 Wonder Woman show. In fact, the only time this version of the character has been acknowledged is in Infinite Crisis, where she makes a very brief cameo. Donna Troy First appearing in the Brave and the Bold issue 60, released in July of 1965, Donna was created by the sorceress Magala to be a playmate for Wonder Woman when she was a kid. How was she created? Well, by using a magic mirror to give life to Wonder Woman's reflection. Though she was given her own personality, she wasn't like a clone of Diana. Unfortunately for her though, she was also abducted by a being known as the Dark Angel, who cursed her to live through various tragic lives. Side note, this Dark Angel person is a version of Donna Troy from Earth-7, and is obsessed with making Donna live through various horrible lives. Comics do be pretty wild. Anyways, Donna was allowed to live various lives, with one of them having her birth mother, a dying teenager, give her up for adoption. Then she was adopted, but then her adopted dad died, so her adopted mom put her into adoption again. 
Anyways, she grew up and became Wonder Girl, Wonder Woman's sidekick. And as Wonder Girl, she helped create the Teen Titans, got married, had a kid, and fought a bunch of crime, until she was one day killed by some Superman robots. But she would return to life after the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, and upon her resurrection, she was given the memories and knowledge of every single version of her from the multiverse. Now alive once again, she was uh, quickly given some false memories to make her believe that she was the goddess of the moon. Why did this happen? Well, because the titans of myth, some ancient gods, thought that she was the chosen one destined to save them from some upcoming threat. She would eventually snap out of these false memories and would battle against the titans of myth. She would then go back to being a superhero, join up with the Justice League, battle zombie Black Lantern versions of her dead husband and son, and also became a member of the Dark Stars. As for Donna Troy's powers, she's got superhuman strength, the ability to feel other people's emotions and thoughts, she's got superhuman speed, superhuman healing, the ability to glide on wind currents, and is very skilled with swords, archery, and staff combat. Making her return in the post-New 52 world in Wonder Woman issue 37, released in February of 2015, Donna Troy continued to fight crime with the Titans, until the Batman Who Laughs infected her. This resulted in her becoming evil, taking up the mantle of Deathbringer, though this didn't last very long and she was cured. As for her appearances in other media, she's appeared in Young Justice, Teen Titans Go!, the DC Animated Film Universe, DC Universe Online, Titans, LEGO DC Supervillains, etc. Costume Redesigns Wonder Woman's costume is arguably one of the most iconic superhero costumes of all time. Despite this, some artists and writers have tried redesigning her appearance, although most of these redesigns didn't stick around for very long. In 2010, artist Jim Lee and writer J. Michael Straczynski came up with a new design. This design had Wonder Woman sporting pants and a biker jacket, but it didn't really last very long. It was even criticized by feminist Gloria Steinem, who said, quote, "...jeans give us the idea that only pants can be powerful. Tell that to Greek warriors and sumo wrestlers." Then we got a new design with even shorter shorts and a Wonder Woman choker. This one was created by Jim Lee, Kali Hammer, and Cliff Chang. Personally, I'm not really a fan of this look because I'm just, I just don't really like the darker colors. Then we got David Finch's Wonder Woman armor, which was designed by both him and his wife, Meredith. And I actually really like this design. Not as her, like, main outfit, but as, like, a battle armor thing or as, like, a secondary costume. I think it looks pretty great. Although I will admit I'm not super big on her wrist gauntlets having blades. The final redesign I want to mention is the one from the 1990s, which is one that everyone hates. Including designer Brian Boland, who said, quote, Everybody disliked that costume, myself included but it was what was asked for at the time. I just wanted to draw her in her original costume. Trinity First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 800, released in August of 2023, Elizabeth Marston Prince, aka Trinity, is the daughter of Wonder Woman from the future. And uh, that's pretty much most of the stuff we know about her. Because, you know, she's Wonder Woman, Diana couldn't always be around, so Elizabeth was often taken care of by John Kent and Damian Wayne. And because of this, she views these two as her older brothers. She fights crime in the future alongside them and goes by the name Trinity. As for her powers, she's got the three lassos of fate. The black lasso, the gold lasso, and the silver lasso. Also, being that she's Wonder Woman's daughter, she's got superhuman strength, speed, and all the standard Wonder Woman abilities. As of right now, she's only appeared once, but I'm sure she'll reappear in no time. Amazon's Attack Superman has At Earth's End, Batman has The Dark Knight Strikes Again, 
and Spider-Man has one more day. Pretty much all the major superheroes have that one storyline that's universally hated. So what's Wonder Woman's? Well, that would be Amazon's Attack. Released from March to August 2007, Amazon's Attack is a six-issue event with 13 tie-in issues ranging from Wonder Woman, Teen Titans, Supergirl, and Catwoman, and is often regarded as the worst Wonder Woman storyline ever. Written by Will Pfeiffer, the story has Wonder Woman being held captive by the U.S. government. And so, in retaliation, the Amazons invade the United States, attempt to assassinate the president, and worst of all, start murdering every single male they come across. I'm talking about civilians. Unarmed civilians and children. Yeah, the Amazons just start killing kids because Wonder Woman is being held captive by the U.S. Department of Metahuman Affairs. Which, don't get me wrong, is very bad, but like, you don't start killing innocent civilians in retaliation for something bad. But then it gets worse, as in response to the invasion, the US government starts creating internment camps for women suspected of having sympathy towards the Amazons. Turns out, though, that Queen Hippolyta was only doing this invasion of America because she was brainwashed by Cersei. Although, it was then revealed that she was actually being tested by Athena. But then it's revealed that Athena is actually Granny Goodness in disguise. So it's like a triple twist. At the end of the event, the Amazons stop fighting, and most of them are turned into mortal women, with no memories of their lives on Themyscira. And uh, that's all of the punishment they get for attempting to commit genocide against all men. Overall, not a very good story. Did give us Batman being terrified of bees, though, so uh, it's okay in my book, I guess. Thankfully, no piece of media has ever tried adapting Amazon's attack. However, in December of 2023, we are getting a new Amazon's attack storyline. Hopefully, this new Amazon's attack storyline is better than the original. Deleted Scenes like all films, the films that feature Wonder Woman in them have scenes that were cut from them. Here's a list of some of them. Although, keep in mind though, I'm going to only be talking about deleted scenes that relate to Wonder Woman or characters related to her, like Ares or Steve Trevor. In Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice, Originally, the photo of Wonder Woman's first mission in the World of Man wasn't going to be her with the Wonder Men in World War I. Instead, it was originally a photo of her taking part in the Crimean War in 1854. However, thanks to Patty Jenkins, Zack Snyder was convinced to move the setting to World War I. As for Wonder Woman 2017, Originally, there was supposed to be an epilogue sequence where Etta Candy meets up with the Wonder Men and proposes another mission involving recovering an artifact from Belgium and returning it to America. This artifact would be revealed to be a mother box. This scene was actually released as its own short film titled Etta's Mission, which makes it the only DCEU short film. The film was also supposed to have another after credits scene showing the mother box activating on Themyscira. As for Justice League 2017, during Steppenwolf's attack on Themyscira, an Amazon would be infected with energy from Steppenwolf's axe. And in order for her not to become a parademon, she Avenger Endgames herself. As for Wonder Woman 1984, Originally, there'd be a scene in which Steve Trevor would be looking confused in a mall. There was also supposed to be a scene where Wonder Woman would be staring at a wall of TVs. There was also supposed to be a scene in which Steve and Diana hail a taxi outside of the Natural History Museum to get to Black Gold. And finally, there was a scene where Wonder Woman flies into near orbit and destroys a missile that was cut. As for the Snyder Cuts, I couldn't find any deleted scenes involving her. As for the Batman, yes, really. There was originally going to be a scene in which you would see some people dressed up in Halloween costumes. 
and some of these costumes would have been of Superman and Wonder Woman. As for Shazam! Fury of the Gods, while not a deleted scene, Diana's cameo at the very end of the film wasn't originally going to be in the film. She was brought into the film when the team behind the movie realized that fans would be pretty annoyed with the Wonder Woman fakeout joke from earlier in the film if they didn't have her show up at the end. Also, Gal Gadot was never on set for the film. She filmed her scenes while working on another film. And as for The Flash, there really isn't any deleted scenes that I haven't talked about in other videos. DC Superhero Girls in 2015, DC and Warner Bros. created a sub-franchise called DC Superhero Girls. This is a franchise heavily marketed towards little girls and preteens. The franchise featured graphic novels, toys, directed DVD films, Lego sets, Lego TV specials, and most famously, a series of 11 to 15 minute long shorts released from October 2015 to December of 2018. Totaling in at 112 episodes, the franchise focuses on various female DC characters attending or working at Superhero High. Some of the major characters include Wonder Woman, Supergirl, Batgirl, Harley Quinn, Bumblebee, Jessica Cruz Green Lantern, Katana, and Poison Ivy. Various other characters would also appear in the show, as recurring characters or guest characters. Some examples include Blackfire, Mira, Raven, Starfire, Frost, Miss Martian, Hawkgirl, Amanda Waller, Cheetah, Enchantress, Catwoman, Star Sapphire, and Big Barda. The series of shorts were so popular that in 2019, a full-on TV series was created. Developed by Lauren Faust of My Little Pony fame, the show ran from March 2019 to October of 2021, and lasted for 78 episodes. This is a separate continuity that focuses on Wonder Woman, Batgirl, Supergirl, Jessica Cruz Green Lantern, Bumblebee, and Zatanna going to Metropolis High School, while also battling villains as the team The Superhero Girls. This show received a mobile game, a full-on video game, and crossed over with Teen Titans Go! three different times. Artemis First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 90, released in September of 1994, Artemis was one of the very few people to hold the mantle of Wonder Woman in the main continuity. Although, it was through some weird circumstances. You see, Queen Hippolyta started seeing visions of the future, and in these visions, she saw Wonder Woman die. So in order to keep Diana alive, she held a contest for the mantle of Wonder Woman, and Artemis won. So basically, she was just like dooming somebody to die in place of Diana. Although, Diana would still fight crime. Side note, Diana had actually met Artemis before, as Diana had met her in Bana Magdal, an Amazon city in Egypt. Wonder Woman wasn't even the first superhero she had met before, as it would be later revealed that Artemis, when she was just 14 years old, was working for Ra's al Ghul. And when she was working for Ra's al Ghul, she fought against Batman and even met Superman. Anyways, Artemis fought crime as Wonder Woman alongside Diana and was even briefly a member of the Justice League. However, she wasn't really well liked by a lot of people because they respected Diana, not the title of Wonder Woman. So she had to earn everyone's respect. And in trying to earn that respect, she died while battling the villain, White Magician. But that wasn't the end of Artemis. She would return pretty soon after, now going by the name Requiem. You see, after her death, she was sent to Tartarus, where she would be beaten and tortured. And despite Diana coming to rescue her, she refused, as she had now become accustomed to her punishment. Anyways, after Diana is captured by some demons, Artemis decides to help her and carries her back into the world of the living, where she becomes her own superhero. Joining the demon hunting group, the Hellenders, she fought against various different demons and villains over the years, 
all while still being an ally to Wonder Woman. As for her powers, Artemis has most of your standard Wonder Woman abilities. She's got superhuman strength, stamina, and agility. She's also skilled with swords, guns, and archery. Artemis would make her return in the post-New 52 world in DCU Rebirth Issue 1, released in July 2016, where she would join forces with Red Hood and to become a member of the Outlaws. She would also become the wielder of the Bow of Ra, which allows her to fire off solar energy arrows. As for her appearances in other media, Artemis has appeared in Superman Batman Apocalypse, Wonder Woman 2009, the DCEU, and even made a cameo in Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe. Wonder Woman 3 In 2020, it was officially confirmed that a third Wonder Woman film starring Gal Gadot was in development, with Patty Jenkins returning to direct and write. And by January 2022, it was looking like the film was going to happen, with filming planned for mid-2023. But then, Warner Bros. and DC were like, Hey, so our last seven theatrical releases were box office bombs, so uh, let's reboot. And so, James Gunn and Peter Safran were given control over the future of the DC film universe, now called the DCU. And because it's a reboot, a third Wonder Woman film just doesn't work anymore. I guess they could still make it, but it would have to be canon to the DCEU, which would confuse general audiences. So yeah, the chances are Wonder Woman 3 won't happen. Despite recent comments from Gal Gadot. Yeah, she says the film is still happening, and that James Gunn and Peter Safran will be involved. However, various insiders and reporters have been saying that she's either lying or is just flat out wrong. I mean, I guess James Gunn did say this, but at the same time, he's also said that every DC film and show released prior to Creature Commandos isn't canon to the DCU. Anyways, I'm sure we'll see Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman again, probably in some Crisis on Infinite Earths type event film. So what was Wonder Woman 3 going to be about? Well, we don't really know. All we know is that the film was going to take place in the present day, and Linda Carter would reprise her role as Asteria, and would have a much bigger role in the film. Yara Floor First appearing in DC Nation Presents DC Future Slate Issue 1, released in November of 2020, Yara Floor is a weird character, in that her first appearance isn't her main universe version. Originally, she was introduced as a potential future Wonder Woman who comes from an Amazon tribe in the well, Amazon. The main universe version of her would make her debut half a year later in Infinite Frontier Issue Zero, released in May of 2021. She was still from the Brazilian Amazon tribe, though she didn't grow up there, as when she was a kid, her mother was killed. And shortly after her mom was killed, she was magically sent away to the far-off magic land of Idaho, where she'd spend the rest of her childhood. Upon turning 21, she'd travel back to her homeland, and would eventually meet the Greek god Eros. And Eros had fallen in love with her. So, he makes her fall in love with him, and uh, pretty much abducts her. For a while, she would trade on Mount Olympus to become the best warrior out there. Though eventually, she would break free from this, and discover that Eros had murdered her mother. Yara would then annihilate him, and uh, he gets sent to Tartarus, so uh, rip bozo. Yara then bails from Mount Olympus and returns to living in the rainforest Amazon tribe. Some time goes by, and she's eventually chosen by her tribe to be their champion in a contest to decide who shall become the next queen of all Amazons, as Queen Apolita had recently died. She wouldn't win the contest, though she would win Diana's respect, who would declare her to be the newest Wonder Girl. As for her powers, Yara has superhuman strength, speed, stamina, and healing. She's also got some kind of hydrokinesis. Basically, she could control water. This was probably because her dad was a Brazilian river god. Probably should have mentioned that earlier. 
As for her appearances in other media, so far she's only appeared in the mobile game DC Legends. Wonder Woman x Superman For decades, there's been fans who ship Superman and Wonder Woman together, mainly because they're both super strong, they can fly, and are two of the three biggest DC characters. However, outside of some multiverse stories like Injustice, Kingdom Come, Frank Miller's Hellscape, Distant Fires, etc., the two haven't really dated. Why is this? Well, because honestly, it's pretty boring. That being said, though, this relationship has happened in the main DC universe. In 2012, in the New 52, it was decided that Superman and Wonder Woman would become a couple. And uh, nobody liked it. So after a few years, not only did their relationship end, but it was flat out retconned out of canon. Side note, the pair have kissed in the past, and have also been attracted to each other. But every time this happens, the story always ends with the two agreeing to stay friends. Egg Fu. Oh god. First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 157, released in October of 1965, Egg Fu is probably the most infamous supervillain of the Silver Age of comics. Because, I mean... Look at him. Created as a giant racist egg supercomputer, Egg Fu waged a war against the United States for a bit, until he was eventually killed by Wonder Woman. As for Egg Fu's abilities, he's super smart, can use his mustache as a whip, and can use radiation to turn people into bioweapons. But that wasn't the end of Egg Fu. As in Metal Men issue 20, released in July of 1966, the brother of Egg Fu, Dr. Yes, battled the Metal Men. Brainwashing them, he would try to make them say, Down with America. But they refused, because they just loved the United States too much. They then broke free of the brainwashing and defeated him. But that wasn't the end of Egg Fu either, as in Wonder Woman issue 166, released in November of 1966, Egg Fu the Fifth appears. He's basically the same as the other Egg Fu, just that he's smaller. He also dies in his very first appearance. But that's not the end of Egg Fu either, although that is the end of him being racist. After the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, Egg Fu was now a dude named Shang Tsu, who first appeared in 52 issue 6, released in August of 2006. He was no longer primarily a Wonder Woman villain, and would instead battle Black Adam, the Justice League, and the Metal Men. This Egg Fu had various different weapons built into a spider-like mech he controlled and walked around in. He's also kind of terrifying in some panels. And finally, in the post-New 52 world, Egg Fu made his debut in Harley Quinn Annual, released in December of 2014. And now, he's no longer a villain, and is just a joke character. His full name is Edgar Fullington Young, and he helps out Harley Quinn. From problematic Egg, to scary Egg, to funny Egg, Egg Fu has quite the history. Egg Fu has also appeared in two pieces of media, DC Universe Online and LEGO DC Supervillains of all things. Wonder Girl Arrowverse Show In November 2020, it was revealed that a Wonder Girl show set in the Arrowverse was in production, with Daylin Rodriguez being the showrunner. The show would follow Yara Floor battling bad guys, and that's literally all we know about it. The show never got far into production, as in February of 2021, it was revealed that the CW had decided to pass on the show. Wonder Woman was a real-life honorary UN ambassador. On October 21st, 2016, Wonder Woman was named an honorary ambassador for the empowerment of women and girls by the United Nations. This was in order to, quote, reach out to Wonder Woman fans to raise awareness of UN's Sustainable Development Goal number 5. This is the United Nations goal to achieve global gender equality by 2030. However, this decision was controversial, and in November of 2016, 
it was decided to remove Diana of her honorary position. And on December 16th, 2016, Diana was officially fired. Side note, in researching this, I found out that Winnie the Pooh and the Red Angry Bird were also both honorary ambassadors. Cassandra Sandsmark First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 105, released in January of 1996, Cassandra Sandsmark was born with no superpowers. Cassie spent most of her time at the Gateway City Museum of Antiquities, and while there, she'd befriend Wonder Woman. And so, one day when she saw Wonder Woman battling some villains, she decided to help her out. She quickly grabbed some magical artifacts, like the Gauntlet of Atlas and the Sandals of Hermes, and headed out to save the day. She would eventually ask Zeus, who would later be revealed to be her father, for some real superpowers. And he was like, alright, sure, why not? And so, Cassie became a superhero. With her first battle being, convincing her mom to let her be a superhero. You see, while Zeus did give her powers, he also made it so that these powers could be turned off by Cassie's mom. While initially against the idea of her being a superhero, her mother would eventually give in and let her fight crime under the name Wonder Girl. As Wonder Girl, Cassie would work under Artemis, join the Teen Titans and Young Justice, date Superboy and Tim Drake, and once became so depressed with Superboy's death, she joined a cult in order to bring him back to life. Yeah, Cassie made some weird decisions, but she would eventually come to her senses, and would even become the leader of the Teen Titans. As for her powers, she's got super strength, the ability to fly, super speed, and she has plenty of skills with swords. She's also got the Lasso of Lightning. Cassie would return in the post-New 52 world in Teen Titans issue 1, released in November of 2011. In this universe, she would actually spend some time being a villain. You see, for a period of time, she had a lot of her memories wiped. And so, she fell into crime with an art thief named Diesel. The two would steal artifacts and treasures from Cassie's mom's dig sites though she would eventually stop her thieving ways, and would even take down Diesel. Also in this universe, Zeus was no longer her dad, but instead her grandfather. As for her appearances in other media, she's appeared in Young Justice, Lego Batman 3, DC Universe Online, Batman and Superman Battle of the Super Sons, and the DC Animated Film Universe. Superwoman? First appearing in Justice League of America, issue 29, released in August of 1964, Superwoman was a member of the Amazons who left her home after discovering the existence of the rest of the world. Now in Man's World, she would discover the Crime Syndicates of America, basically an alternate universe evil Justice League. She joined their roster as their equivalent of Wonder Woman, and basically ruled the entire world. That was, until they came into contact with the heroes of the main DC Universe, who defeated them. They would battle them a few more times, before eventually being killed during Crisis on Infinite Earths, when Anti-Monitor rolled in to annihilate their universe. Despite appearing quite a few times, Superwoman never really did anything outside of the team, but she was always there. As for her powers, Superwoman has all your standard Wonder Woman abilities, like superhuman speed, stamina, strength, the ability to glide on wind currents, etc. She's also got her own lasso, the Lasso of Submission. Superwoman would return in the post-New 52 world in Justice League issue 23, released in October of 2013. Besides her name now being Lois Lane, most of her backstory was pretty much the same. However, she was also in a relationship with three different people at the exact same time. She was married to Ultraman while having an affair with Owlman, and having yet another affair with Luther. Anyways, when she found out that she was pregnant, she manipulated both Ultraman and Owlman, telling both of them that it was their baby, hoping that they would fight each other to the death. Turns out, though, it was Luther's kid. 
and when she eventually gave birth to her kid, she immediately used her baby to drain the powers of Superman and Lex Luthor. It turns out, this baby has absorbing powers, but uh, Superwoman would end up being killed shortly afterwards, though she would eventually be resurrected, only to die again. But she'd be resurrected yet again, and this time joined a new supervillain team called the Injustice Incarnate. And finally, I gotta talk about Donna Troy again. First appearing in Crime Syndicate Issue 1, released in May of 2021, Donna Troy from Earth-3 grew up on Demon's Island, their universe's version of Paradise Island. Steve Trevor would crash land on the island and ask the inhabitants for help. Donna would actually refuse to help him, so Steve would take her hostage, only for Donna to then just straight up kill him. She then left Demon's Island, and joined her universe's version of the Crime Syndicate of America, vowing one day to return to her homeland and kill Hippolyta. Anyways, this version of the character hasn't appeared in any media. However, the original Superwoman has appeared in a few pieces of media, like DC Universe Online, DC Worlds Collide, LEGO DC Supervillains, Justice League Crisis on Two Earths, and DC Legends. Nubia First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 204, released in February of 1973, Nubia is Wonder Woman's twin sister. However, Diana originally didn't know about her twin sister, because shortly after her birth, or I guess creation because she's also made of clay, Nubia was abducted by Mars, aka Ares who raised her as his own in order to one day have her destroy all the Amazons. Eventually, she'd be sent out to battle Wonder Woman, and the fight would end in a draw. Well, kinda. Nubia technically wins, but she refuses to kill Diana, and I'm pretty sure Wonder Woman could have, like, kept fighting. Anyways, she declares herself the one true Wonder Woman, and uh, then bails. Meanwhile, Hippolyta is just like, oh, that's my other daughter. <laughs> Oops, probably should have told Diana about that one. Anyways, she would eventually return with an army to take out the mascara, but Diana would break her free from Ares' brainwashing, and Nubia is just like, oh, my bad guys, I'm gonna head home. And outside of a small appearance where she helps out Supergirl, and an appearance in the Super Friends comic series, she was completely absent from DC Comics for about 20 years. She would eventually return in Wonder Woman Annual 8, released in September of 1999. However, this version of Nubia is different. Not only is her name spelled differently, but this is her after the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. So all that stuff I talked about before didn't happen to her. In fact, she's not even Diana's sister anymore and was even around long before Diana was born. As for her powers, Nubia has similar powers to Diana in that she has superhuman strength, the ability to glide on wind currents, and super speed. She's also got a magic sword, so that's pretty neat. She would make her return in the post-New 52 universe in Wonder Woman issue 75, released in September of 2019. And this version of the character is by far the most prominent. Originally not an Amazon, Nubia was a princess named Zahava, who lived on Madagascar. However, she would eventually be killed and was reborn from the Well of Souls. Now an Amazon, she would work with her sisters for centuries and would eventually become the queen of all Amazons. She was also reborn on the exact same day that Diana was born, so many consider them sisters. This version of the character also wields the Staff of Understanding, and had a pet cheetah. As for her appearances in other media, she's appeared in DC Universe Online and DC Legends. She was going to appear in the 1975 series, but she was cut, despite a doll of her being made. War of the Gods Releasing from September to December of 1991, and written by George Perez and Russell Braun, War of the Gods is a four-issue event created to celebrate Wonder Woman's 50th anniversary. 
Well, four issues and 21 tie-in issues, ranging from issues of Dr. Fate, Starman, Batman, Hawk and Dove, Legion, The Demon, Hawk World, New Titans, etc. The plot centers around the world being currently against the Mascara, as the Amazons are framed for various murders and robberies. This was done by Circe, who is also currently pitting the Roman gods against the Greek gods, against the Egyptian gods, against the Germanic gods, against the Mesopotamian gods, against the West African gods, and against the Phanagarian gods. Meanwhile, the United States is about to invade the Mascara, so there's just like a bunch of war going on. Eventually, the heroes of Earth convince the gods to stop fighting each other and face off against Circe instead. Wonder Woman is also briefly killed during a confrontation with Circe, though she does get resurrected pretty soon after and joins up with Donna Troy in taking out Circe. By the end of the event, the war is over, Circe is dead, various gods are dead, and the day is saved. Now this event isn't just notable for being a celebration of Wonder Woman, but it's also sadly known for some behind the scenes problems. You see, George Perez was not happy with DC at the time, as he didn't think they were doing enough to celebrate the occasion, and weren't doing enough to promote the miniseries. There were also various editorial problems he was facing behind the scenes. And so, he stopped working for DC until 1996. The Invisible Jet First appearing in Sensation Comics issue 1, released in January of 1942, Wonder Woman's Invisible Jet is probably the most made fun of superhero vehicle out there. Sure, the Spider-Mobile and the Supermobile are pretty funny, but they're barely ever used. The Invisible Jet, on the other hand, has appeared in hundreds of comics and in each universe that it's appeared in, it's had its own unique origin. In the original DC Universe, Wonder Woman had to travel across the globe to piece the plane back together, and since she was the one who fixed the plane, it would only work under her command. In Earth-1, the plane was originally Pegasus, who was transformed into a plane by Athena. In New Earth, it was created by the Lansanarian Morphing Disk though Diana would actually have two invisible jets in this universe, with another one being given to her by Batman. And finally, in the New 52 universe, it was created via modifying the plane Steve Trevor was piloting when he crashed on the mascara, though she would later create two more invisible jets. Anyways, as for the invisible jet's features, it has invisibility, obviously, teleportation, insane speed, the ability to be piloted both underwater and in space, and can fire off lightning blasts and invisible missiles. As for its appearances in other media, the Invisible Jet has appeared in the 1975 series, the DCAU, the DCEU, Harley Quinn, Wonder Woman 2009, and Teen Titans Go! you could have national power and power gem. Well, that's probably good she's got the power after all. Yes. Wonder Woman kills like a million people while banging. So during the Dark Knight Strikes Again, Superman and Wonder Woman decide to bang while flying around the Earth. The power created from the two of them doing this causes earthquakes to happen across the globe, which results in a bunch of tsunamis happening, alongside volcanic eruptions and hurricane-like winds to appear across the globe. Also, after realizing what happened, Wonder Woman makes a joke. Uh, just terrible. The Amazon's DCEU Film In December of 2019, 
Patty Jenkins announced that a Wonder Woman spin-off film set in the DCEU was in development. This film would focus on the Amazons of Themyscira, after the events of the first Wonder Woman film, though there would also be scenes set before the first Wonder Woman film, so it would both be a sequel and a prequel. Though she announced it, she would later clarify that she wasn't going to be the one directing the film, but would instead serve as a producer. She also mentioned that Gal Gadot would serve as an executive producer, and Jeff Johns was the one who came up with the story for the film. And finally, Connie Nielsen revealed in February of 2021 that she would be appearing in the film, reprising her role as Queen Hippolyta. However, like with Wonder Woman 3, this film was cancelled with a DCU reboot. However, it's very possible that elements of this film will be used in the upcoming DCU series Paradise Lost, as that show will be all about the Amazons. Original Casting Like with every movie and TV show, the actors who play Wonder Woman characters in media aren't usually the first choice. Here's a list of actors who were considered or auditioned for roles relating to Wonder Woman and her supporting cast. For the 1974 Wonder Woman, there was Angie Bowie. She actually lost the role because she refused to wear a bra. For the 1975 Wonder Woman, there was Jacqueline Smith, Kate Jackson, and Farrah Fawcett. Kathy Lee Crosby was also offered the role after the release of the 1974 film. As for the DCEU Wonder Woman, there was Jamie Alexander, Olga Kurilenko, and Elodie Young. As for the DCEU Steve Trevor, there was Liam Hemsworth, Sam Worthington, and Alexander Skarsgård. As for the DCEU Cheetah, there was Emma Stone. And finally, as for the DCEU Queen Hippolyta, there was Nicole Kidman and Charlize Theron. Aurora of Themyscira during Marvel and DC's Amalgam crossover, a bunch of Marvel characters were combined with DC characters, and Wonder Woman was no different. First appearing in DC vs. Marvel issue 3, released in February of 1996, Aurora of Themyscira is a combination between Wonder Woman and Storm from Marvel Comics. Born a normal human, Aurora traveled with her father across the Mediterranean Sea, hunting for treasure. But because her dad was a treasure hunter, Poseidon wasn't a fan of him, so he killed her father. But before he killed her father, he had his wife leave him and all of his treasure hunting funds cut off. But yeah, Poseidon would eventually sink the ship that he and his daughter were on, and Aurora was the only survivor being rescued by Queen Hippolyta and raised as an Amazon alongside Diana of Themyscira. Yeah, Wonder Woman actually has two different amalgamation variants. I'll talk about her in just a second. Anyways, it turns out that Aurora wasn't a normal human, but instead a mutant with the ability to manipulate the weather. Using her powers, she would then go after Poseidon, but he was like, Thawi so she left him alone. She would then join the superhero team, the Justice League X-Men, and take up the superhero name, Amazon. As for her powers, she's got weather manipulation, superhuman strength, and the ability to fly. Meanwhile, there's the other Diana, who's just called Diana Prince, and she's a combination between Wonder Woman and Marvel's Elektra. She left Themyscira after losing a contest to become Wonder Woman, and would fight crime all across the globe, even at one point working under the King of Wakanda, Bronze Tiger. She would eventually meet up with the Punisher, work with him for a bit, had a kid with him, and then divorced him. As for her abilities, Diana has superhuman strength, adamantium bracelets, and is a master at archery. Wonder Woman The Animated Series In 1994, Boyd Kirkland, who was heavily involved with Batman The Animated Series, approached Fox Kids and pitched a Wonder Woman cartoon. Fox, however, would decline, so he went to Kids WB and pitched the idea there. They also declined. 
This was despite both companies wanting a girl-oriented action animated series. As for what the show would have been about, outside of it obviously starring Wonder Woman and most likely taking place in the DCAU, we don't know anything about the story. Wonder Woman 77 Written by various authors, including Trina Robbins, Amanda Diebert, Amy Chu, Ruth Fletcher, Christo Gage, and Mark Andrico, Wonder Woman 77 was a series of comics that continued the story of the original 1975 Wonder Woman series. Not only does it continue the story, but the comic also introduces a bunch of Wonder Woman's characters into this continuity like Cheetah, Silver Swan, Dr. Psycho, Nubia, etc. Also, Clayface shows up for some reason. Oh right, because Diana's made of clay and Clayface is clay. Okay, actually that makes sense. The original four-issue run of the series ran from January 2015 to September of 2016. The first three issues are just your standard Wonder Woman stories, while the fourth one is actually a direct sequel to an episode of the show. Galt's Brain. In 2017, a sequel crossover series would be released, in which the 60s Batman series crossed over with Wonder Woman, thus making the two shows set in the same continuity. It's also mentioned that Adam West Batman straight up killed Cesar Romero Joker in the series, after Joker killed Alfred. This miniseries lasted for six issues, and would be followed by yet another crossover miniseries. However, this time, it was a crossover with a completely different franchise. Wonder Woman Meets the Bionic Woman Releasing from April 2017 to November of the same year, and written by Andy Mangles, Wonder Woman 77 Meets the Bionic Woman is a six-issue crossover series that crosses over the 1975 Wonder Woman series with the TV show The Bionic Woman which lasted three seasons, running from January of 1976 to May of 1978. And because The Bionic Woman is a spin-off of The Six Million Dollar Man, this means that that show is also canon with Wonder Woman and the 60s Batman series. And since Batman 66 crossed over with the Green Hornet, I guess we now have a 60s-70s style cinematic universe. Kinda, I don't know. The plot of the story has Diana and Jamie Summers teaming up, when some of their villains join forces and create the organization Castra. These villains include Dr. Cyber, Dr. Solano, Orlick Hoffman, and Captain Rattle from Wonder Woman 1975, and Carl Franklin and Ivan Karp from The Bionic Woman. Overall, it's a solid crossover, although if you're like me and you don't know anything about the Bionic Woman, it might not be that interesting of a read. Vanessa Capitellis First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 3, released in April of 1987, Vanessa was a good friend of Wonder Woman. Nicknamed Nessie after the Loch Ness Monster, no really, she had a pretty rough life before meeting Diana, as not only did her father die when she was very young, but her best friend Lucy committed Avengers Endgame Yourself. All of this trauma, alongside the fact that she grew up feeling like an outsider, was getting the best of her, causing her to believe that she was to blame for everything bad that happened in her life. Because of her current state and her friendship with Wonder Woman, the villain, Dr. Psycho, showed up and began messing with her head and gaslighting her, making her believe that Diana was abandoning her. But then Cersei showed up, and wanting to use Vanessa to mess with Diana, she teamed up with Dr. Psycho and continued messing with her head. Until eventually, they had her undergo cybernetic modifications and mental conditioning to become the supervillain, the Silver Swan. And almost immediately after becoming the Silver Swan, Nessie battled Wonder Woman and Cassie Wonder Girl. And not only did she expose Cassie's identity to the public during the fight, but she also killed over a hundred people as she destroyed Cassie's school. After another battle with Diana, she was defeated and sent off the Themyscira to be treated. 
However, I guess treatment didn't really go so well because she would eventually show up again with various other villains. Though, by Wonder Woman issue 600, she was fully cured of her cybernetics and was back to living a normal life. As for her powers, Vanessa has the ability to fly, has various cybernetic enhancements, and has the ability to do sonic screams. She's also got these like weird finger claws. Making her return in the post-New 52 world in Wonder Woman issue 38, released in March 2018, Vanessa's life was very different. She was still a friend of Wonder Woman, but she lost the ability to walk due to being injured during a fight between Wonder Woman and Major Disaster. This not only crippled her, but also ended her career as a ballet dancer. Eventually, she would be given the opportunity to walk again with the help of some nanobites. She took the opportunity, and it worked. However, this is also where things went really bad, as when she was injured, Wonder Woman would visit her. But now that she was getting better, she wasn't visiting Vanessa as much. And eventually, Vanessa would discover Diana visiting other injured people believing that she had never been special to her. That, combined with her mother's death, made the nanobites in her body create a split personality. And thus, she became the supervillain Silver Swan. Or maybe I should say serial killer instead, because that's basically what she was. She tracked down and killed every single injured person she saw on TV with Wonder Woman. Obviously, this led to her fighting Diana. She would eventually be defeated and would end up in a coma, although she would eventually wake up and battle Wonder Woman again. Although this time, she was actually convinced to get help. As for this version of Vanessa's abilities, she's got the ability to fly, she's got extremely sharp claws, superhuman speed, technokinesis, superhuman strength, and had the ability to fire off sonic screams. As for Vanessa's appearances in other media, she's appeared in Wonder Woman Bloodlines and Scribblenauts Unmasked, a DC Comics adventure. Ivan Reitman's Wonder Woman film. In 1996, director Ivan Reitman was hired by Warner Bros. in DC to write, produce, and direct a Wonder Woman film with a similar tone to Batman Forever. Ivan would struggle to write a script for the film, and would eventually take a break on the project, to work on other projects. He would return in 1998, but by then, Batman and Robin had come out, and Warner Bros. didn't want anything resembling that movie. So the project was in turmoil, and eventually in 1999, Ivan would leave the project. And that's literally all we know about this film. Nothing about this film's plot is actually known. The Justice Society's Secretary When Wonder Woman was accepted into the Justice Society of America, she was hired only as the team's secretary. In fact, she wasn't even considered an official member. Instead, she was known as an honorary member. This was despite her being easily one of the most powerful members on the team. But despite her power, the team would refuse to let her go on a bunch of missions. Now why was this? Why did they make her just a secretary? Because Diana's a woman. There's not really, like, any other reason. It's pretty blatant sexism. But hey, Diana seems pretty into it. At least on the outside. Wonder Woman and the Star Riders. This is a 15-page one-shot comic released inside of select Kellogg cereal boxes. The plot of this comic has Wonder Woman leading a team of heroes called the Star Riders as they battle the villain, Persia, who's stolen their magical star jewels. At first glance, this comic just seems like a weird promotional comic. But in actuality, it's not just a promotional comic. It's also the sole survivor of a cancelled Wonder Woman sub-franchise. You see, in the early 1990s, DC really wanted to make a show like She-Ra. So they partnered with Mattel to create a cartoon and toy line based around Wonder Woman and her new friends, the Star Riders. 
Anyways, this comic was produced to tie in with the cartoon and a toy line, but both of these were cancelled. Well, kinda. While both of these were cancelled, the designs for the toys were actually repurposed by Mattel for their other toy line, Tenko and the Guardians of Magic. And that toy line actually had a cartoon. So in a really weird way, Wonder Woman and the Star Riders actually did happen. Except not really. Angle Man First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 115, released in July of 1960, Angelo Ben was a pretty wacky dude, obsessed with angles. Originally, he was just your average thief. However, Angelo was constantly getting arrested by police, so he realized he needed a new angle. Instead of just doing standard robberies, Angelo began heavily planning out his robberies and heists, and uh, he was pretty good at it. However, no amount of planning would help him when Wonder Woman showed up. In order to defeat Wonder Woman, Angelo realized he needed to become something more. So he became the supervillain, the Angle Man. And luckily for him, he came into possession of the Angler, a triangle-shaped device from Apocalypse that allows him to warp through angles, dimensions, and time. As Angle Man, he would join the secret society of supervillains and battle Wonder Woman, until he died during Crisis on Infinite Earths. But after Crisis, a new version of him showed up in The Flash issue 155, released in December of 1999. His backstory was pretty much the same, but was now a villain of Donna Troy and Flash. Angelo would even fall in love with Donna, but uh, she didn't really like him at all. Anyways, he continued to do a bunch of robberies until one day he was like, I'm gonna hold a baby hostage. And so, he broke into Catwoman's apartment and attempted to hold her baby as ransom. Catwoman was uh, understandably a little bit mad, so she beat the crap out of him. Angleman would return in the post-New 52 world in Aquaman issue 23.1, Black Manta, released in November of 2013. Now the son of Vandal Savage, Angelo was a reformed supervillain working for the President of the United States. At least, that's what it looked like. In reality, he was working with his father on a villainous scheme. But eventually, his dad would turn on him and be like, Nah, you're kinda lame, and ripped out his son's tongue. But he lived, so uh, he'll probably want revenge. Maybe. I don't know. Finally, in Wonder Woman issue 41, released in April 2018, Angelette was introduced. Literally nothing is known about her other than she has the angler and is working for Veronica Kale. She's basically just Angleman, but a woman. As for Angleman's abilities, he's got none, except for his planning skills. But with the angler, he can warp to different places, fly, and manipulate time. As for his appearances in other media, he's appeared in Justice League Unlimited, Batman the Brave and the Bold, and Scribblenauts Unmasked, a DC Comics adventure. Wonder Woman, The True Amazon Written by Jill Thompson and released in November of 2016, Wonder Woman, The True Amazon is a graphic novel set in another universe. In this universe, Diana was created when Hippolyta started singing next to her weird sand baby. This caused a chain reaction that led to Zeus granting life to the sand infant. Growing up, Diana was kind of a brat. She was spoiled beyond belief and would prank people constantly. Despite all of this, everyone loved her, except for a stable woman named Alethea. Diana was really into her, so she wanted to win her over. But how do you win somebody over? Well, you travel into the darkest parts of Themyscira and provoke a bunch of monsters so you can then kill them and take their treasure. However, this doesn't really work out because Alethea doesn't really care. Turns out, in order to win her approval, Diana has to become a respectful person. But Diana doesn't really listen, 
And so, during a big race, Diana summons a bunch of monsters in order to distract her competitors. This, uh, does not end well, as the monsters straight up kill Alethea. After her death, Diana realized that Alethea was a true Amazon, while she herself wasn't. And after that, she kisses her corpse. That's not sanitary. So then Hippolyta is just like, all right, Diana, you gotta go. Go live in man's world for a while or something until you make up for the deaths you've caused. And uh, that's the end of the story. Diana goofed, got her crush killed, and uh, now she has to spend the rest of her days being a superhero as punishment. Wonder Woman joins the Starfire Corps. During the Blackest Night event, a bunch of characters got temporary lantern powers. For example, Flash became a Blue Lantern, while a bunch of dead guys got turned into Black Lanterns. And Wonder Woman became a temporary lantern as well. But not blue, black, white, or green. Instead, she became a temporary member of the Star Sapphire Lanterns. After being a Black Lantern. So, like, okay, she became a Black Lantern too, but let's focus on the cooler one. She was cured from being a Black Lantern by the love that she has for Earth and creation itself, which made the Sapphire Ring choose her. Aphrodite even showed up and was like, yeah, use the ring, it's pretty cool. Now a Star Sapphire member, she battled various Black Lanterns. She even battled Mira, who was a Red Lantern at the time. Eventually, she would also become a White Lantern for a bit in order to battle Necron, the Guardian of Death. Okay, so she also becomes a White Lantern too. Screw it. The entry's name is now changed to Wonder Woman Becomes Various Lanterns. Years later, in Wonder Woman Annual 2, released in August of 2018, Diana became a Star Sapphire Lantern yet again, in order to help out the Star Sapphire Corps in defeating various Dark Gods, like Carnell. When she's a Star Sapphire Lantern, she gains the ability to fire off energy blasts, create force fields, and energy constructs. She can also crystallize people with the power of love, and travel through space also using the power of love. Etta Candy First appearing in Sensation Comics issue 2, released in February of 1942, Etta Candy is one of Wonder Woman's closest friends. And like Steve Trevor, she's continued to appear alongside Diana throughout her entire history. Etta also created the Holiday Girls, a group of women disguised as a sorority but in actuality, were a group of women who tracked down German spies. Because this was in World War II. After the war, they switched from fighting the Axis powers to fighting aliens. Yeah, she was a very busy person. Side note, uh, she was also very into being overweight, and so carried around a box of chocolates with her at all times. This would change with future versions of the character. Also, she liked to pretend that she was always 16 years old, like she was a hollow live idol. So on her birthdays, she would eat a 16 course meal. Again, this would uh, change with future versions. The Silver Age version of the character first appeared in Wonder Woman issue 117, released in October of 1960, and uh, didn't really appear as much as her Golden Age counterpart. In fact, for about 20 years, she wasn't in a single comic. But she would return in 1980, where she was now a huge fan of Betty Crocker. She also went to hell once, after being kidnapped by some Satanists. Once again, she's a very busy person. Her post-Crisis on Infinite Earths incarnation first appeared in Wonder Woman issue 2, released in March of 1987. And this version of the character actually got married, and like her previous incarnations, was a member of the United States Air Force. And finally, she made her return in the post-New 52 world in Justice League Issue 7, released in May of 2012. This version of the character is very different from earlier versions. She was now African American, and was now gay, being really into Wonder Woman's arch-nemesis, Cheetah. 
Cheetah was also really into her, but she simply refused to be with Etta due to her, you know, now being evil. As for her appearances in other media, she's appeared in the DC Animated Film Universe, the DCEU, Wonder Woman 1975, Scribblenauts Unmasked, a DC Comics adventure, and Wonder Woman 2009. Wonder Woman, Dead Earth. Dead Earth is a four-issue miniseries written by Daniel Warren Johnson, and tells a story set in another universe where Wonder Woman battles monsters in a post-apocalyptic Earth. Basically, Wonder Woman kills Superman, and the fight between the two causes the world to end. But why would she kill Superman? Well, because Themyscira got nuked after a war between humanity and the Amazons that was caused by humanity refusing the Amazons' help in combating climate change and resource depletion. Superman tried to stop the nuclear attack, but failed. Just a little bit angry, Diana let her anger out on Superman. So, uh, yeah, Diana is partially to blame for the world being in chaos. Partially, the nukes didn't exactly help either. Anyways, she teams up with the last remnants of humanity to battle the mutated abominations that plague the world. Though it's not just humans that she teams up with, but also Cheetah, who is now a monster. Turns out, after the world ended, humanity thought that she was working with Diana to destroy the world. So they experimented on her. But it gets worse. The abominations terrorizing the world are actually the remnants of the Amazons. Because of their immortality and magic, the nuclear hellfire didn't exactly wipe them out, but instead turned them into monsters. And these monsters are being led by Hippolyta, who wants to wipe out humanity for what they've done. Diana's like, no, and kills all the monsters. So Hippolyta retreats into exile. Side note, uh, can't exactly show you this, but uh, Wonder Woman rips out Superman's spine and skull from his corpse and uses it as a weapon. Insane. Wonder Woman was racist during World War II. In one of her many outings during World War II, Diana called a bunch of Japanese soldiers... Well, I'm not gonna say it, but, you know, there it is. Yeah, there's not really much else to say here. Wonder Woman said something pretty, pretty bad. The Triple Stars. Appearing in Wonder Woman issue 176, released in May of 1968, Jackie, Joey, and Johnny Starr are three brothers who are obsessed with Wonder Woman to the point where they decide to compete for her love. So the brothers take a serum that gives them superpowers. Now superheroes, the brothers decide to help out Wonder Woman on June 18th, the day she loses her powers every year. Yeah, this is a bit of Wonder Woman lore that only exists in this issue, nowhere else. Kinda, we'll, we'll get to it. Anyways, now that she doesn't have any superpowers, being a superhero is a little bit harder. Luckily, the Triple Stars show up to save the day in order to impress Diana. And uh, somehow this kind of works. Like Diana says that she can't think straight when she's with them. She even compliments them saying like, wow, he's so funny and handsome and perfect. So I guess that she's uh, kind of into them. But by the end of the story, the brothers lose all their powers while Wonder Woman regains hers, and tells the brothers that she can't marry any of them, because she's a superhero. Wield their powers. Feel their fury. Fight for justice. When the world needs heroes, no one else is in their league. Justice League Heroes. Wonder Girl spin-off show In the late 1970s, there were discussions about making a spin-off show to Wonder Woman that would focus on Wonder Girl, played by Deborah Winger. And there's a decent chance that this show would have happened. So why didn't it? Well, because Deborah Winger really didn't like working on the show. She hated working on the show so much 
that she bought out her contract with Warner Bros. in order for her to leave the show early. Because of this, multiple episodes of Wonder Woman would be cancelled as she was set to appear in them, and talks of the spin-off were pretty much just completely abandoned. Chief is Nappy. So you know Chief, one of the Wonder Men from Wonder Woman 2017? Yeah, well it turns out that he's actually the demigod Nappy. Now most people who saw the film wouldn't have been able to tell, but when Chief introduces himself to Diana, he calls himself Nappy, while speaking in his native language, Blackfoot. Now people initially thought that this was just like a small detail that the actor Brave Rock improvised. But no, it turns out that Nappy is in the script, so the character was written to be a demigod. Unfortunately, this didn't really get explored in the film, but it's a neat detail. Scrapped Appearance in Superman the Animated Series So the DCAU Wonder Woman, in my opinion, is the best adaptation of the character, and a lot of people agree. So it's especially sad to know that she only appears in Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. However, she was originally going to be introduced into the DCAU in Superman the Animated Series, just like how The Flash was. She would have appeared as a guest character in one episode, but the pitch for the episode was rejected. She was also going to make a guest appearance in Batman Beyond in the episode The Call. But because of weird rights issues, the team behind the show couldn't use her, so they replaced her with Big Barda. Wonder Woman's Invisible Twin In Wonder Woman issue 59, released in May of 1953, Wonder Woman is just about to start her day, when suddenly, some invisible force begins to strangle her. She's obviously pretty spooked by this, and uh, pretty soon though, the invisible entity just vanishes, just as quickly as it arrived. And it just as quickly returns, as this invisible force keeps messing with Diana throughout her entire day. This all comes to an end when she accidentally falls off a bridge after her lasso gets zapped by lightning. This somehow causes her to end up in another reality, where she's met by the Wonder Woman of that reality, Tara Taruna. Anyways, it turns out that the invisible entity that was attacking Diana was actually the evil villain Duke Dasm's henchmen attempting to assassinate Tara. And because of some weird time warp situation, every attempt at her life also affected Diana. So the pair then team up to defeat Duke Dasm and his soldiers. Shortly after defeating him, Diana's lasso is hit by lightning yet again, and she's sent back to her universe. Side note, this story opens up saying that this story could happen to you. So watch out, I guess. Historia, the Amazons. Releasing from January 2022 to February of 2023, Historia, the Amazons is a three-issue miniseries written by Kelly Sue DeConnick. Originally pitched as a nine-issue epic, the series tells the entire history of the Amazons. Well, the Amazons in a different universe. Yeah, this isn't canon to the main DC universe. The story follows Hippolyta and reveals her origins as a normal woman who tracked down and joined the Amazons after being saved by them. She also kills a baby. I mean, she was forced to abandon the baby, so it wasn't entirely her fault, but like, she still did it. Uh, basically, a woman and her husband had a fourth kid and were like, we don't want her. Go leave the baby in the forest as an offering to the gods. Hippolyta was forced to do so, but wasn't happy about it. So she would try to save the baby shortly after abandoning it. But it was too late. Baby dead. But this baby's soul was then captured by the god Hera, who took the soul and placed it in the sand baby Hippolyta would later create. So basically, the baby was reborn into Diana. Hippolyta would also save a bunch of slaves and battle a bunch of meaners, like Hercules. And uh, that's all I'm gonna say. There's a ton of stuff in this series that I won't spoil, because this series wrapped up less than a year ago. So, if you're interested in it, go check it out. Cancelled Live Action Show 
In 2011, a pilot was created for a live-action Wonder Woman series that would air on NBC. Simply titled Wonder Woman, this pilot stars Adrian Palicki as Diana Prince. As she battles various criminals and takes down the evil businesswoman Veronica Kale, all while she girl bosses at her business, Themyscira Industries, which builds technology using funds created by selling Wonder Woman merch. And this pilot was terrible. NBC didn't pick up the show after seeing the pilot, and eventually, when the pilot was leaked to the public, many people were just shocked at how bad it was. With the acting, dialogue, and the changes to the source material all being the biggest criticisms. Well, all of those and Wonder Woman's costume. And it wasn't just critics and fans who didn't like this pilot. The pilot's own writer, David E. Kelly, has admitted that the pilot isn't very good, and that he wishes he had a chance to fix the issues with it. As for the other characters featured in this pilot, there's Steve Trevor and Etta Candy, with Steve Trevor now being a member of the United States Department of Justice. There's also a character named Ed, played by Pedro Pascal, of Mandalorian, Last of Us, Game of Thrones, Wonder Woman 1984, Kingsman, Narcos, and maybe Fantastic Four fame, Wonder Woman turns back into clay. So remember the War of the Gods event I talked about in Tier 1? Well, I mentioned that Wonder Woman briefly dies in the event, and uh, it's true, she does die. But I purposely left out how she dies, because it's a rather weird way. During the War of the Gods, Issue 3 to be exact, Diana is confronted by Cersei on the beaches of Themyscira, and she's ready for a fight. However, Cersei isn't, and instead of fighting, Cersei uses her magic to turn Diana back into the very clay she was made from. This is only possible because the clay she was made from came from this very beach they're on. And so Diana dies, being turned back into clay. Meanwhile, Cersei is pretty hyped. Though not for long, as Diana would return to life in the next issue. Mouse Man First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 141, released in October of 1963, Mouse Man is a strange villain. We don't really know anything about this dude's backstory. In fact, we don't even know his name. The only things we know about him was that he was a villain of Wonder Woman's who attempted to defeat her in order to win a gold trophy, as he was a member of the Academy of Arch Villains. He would end up fighting her a few more times over the years, teaming up with Dr. Cyber, creating his own mouse army, and even capturing Diana, forcing her to do a bunch of weird circus acts. As for his powers, he can shrink himself down to the size of a mouse. He can also control an army of rats, and move extremely fast when small. He's also a chemist, and uh, that's about it. He would make his return in the post-New 52 world in Forever Evil, Argus, issue 5, released in April of 2014, where he'd show up and be killed in the same issue by Killer Frost. While he hasn't appeared in any pieces of media outside of comics, he has shown up in the Batman the Brave and the Bold comic series. John Cohen's Wonder Woman film in 1999, John Cohen was hired to direct a live-action film based on Wonder Woman, with Joel Silver producing and Todd Alcott writing the script. And, uh, nothing happened. Yeah, this Wonder Woman film never got far into production, though we at least know a few actresses that were considered for the role of Diana. Mariah Carey? <laughs> no, really. Lucy Lawless, Catherine Zeta-Jones, and Sandra Bullock with the latter being the one that Joel Silver really wanted in the film. By 2003, Todd Alcott was removed from the project and replaced with Lyda Kalo Grittes, but this version of the film would eventually be canned in favor of yet another cancelled Wonder Woman film that I'll talk about in just a little bit. Pung Dylan First appearing in New Superman Issue 1, released in September of 2016, Dylan is the Wonder Woman of China, but unlike Wonder Woman, she's not an Amazon. In fact, she's actually a mythical snake. No, really. She's an adaptation of the Chinese mythology character, 
Zhao King. Basically, her friend White Snake and her traveled to the human world because White Snake was in love with a human. They were later attacked by a turtle named Fahai, who transformed himself into a human because he was really into White Snake. Green Snake, that's her, protected her friend from the attack, but was transformed into stone by the sorcerer turtle. And for centuries, she remained a statue until one day she was freed by Dr. Omen. Now free, she befriended the Superman of China and joined the Justice League of China as this team's Wonder Woman equivalent. This is, despite her having almost none of Wonder Woman's abilities. Instead, she has her own lineup of powers. She can fly, transform into a giant snake, use telepathy, regrow lost limbs, and even has fangs. Cause, you know, snake. She's also got her own lasso that's an extension of her skin. As of right now, unfortunately, she hasn't appeared in any piece of media. Cancelled Wonder Woman and Xena crossover. In the 1990s, there were plans for a crossover comic between Wonder Woman and Xena, Warrior Princess. However, before the comic could be released, it was cancelled. But the interesting thing is, this comic is pretty much done. No, really. According to Gail Simone, the comic was completely drawn and written, but it was still cancelled. So what was this comic going to be about? Well, apparently, it was going to be a very light-hearted one-shot titled The Princess War Diaries, and would have had Wonder Woman and Cassie Wonder Girl being transported into Xena's universe. This only happens because Ares is just like, you know, transporting Wonder Woman to another world would be pretty entertaining. Anyways, they're sent to Xena's realm, and eventually a fight breaks out between the two heroes. And at some point in the story, Diana would end up wearing Xena's armor, while Xena would somehow end up wearing Wonder Woman's outfit. Anyways, this comic was cancelled because it would have been released after Xena ended, and also DC wasn't super big on Wonder Woman being used in an action comedy setting. Who's Afraid of Diana Prince? In 1967, a short pilot was filmed for a Wonder Woman TV series inspired by the 1960s Batman series. The pilot, titled Who's Afraid of Diana Prince, had Wonder Woman not really being a thing. Yeah, the story of the show would have had Diana Prince be an awkward woman living with her mom, and her mom was constantly getting mad at her for not having a boyfriend. But whenever she was alone, Diana would change into a Wonder Woman costume and pretend to fight crime. Granted, this could have just been the plot of the episode, and the rest of the show would have had her actually being a superhero, but nothing else is really known about this rejected show. DC vs. Vampires Releasing from December of 2021 to February of 2023, DC vs. Vampires is a 12-issue series written by Matthew Rosenberg and James Tinian IV. The story is about a vampire virus spreading through the DC universe that tears the world of DC's heroes and villains apart. Led by Vampire Nightwing, the vampires begin to infect various characters, like Hal Jordan, Zatanna, Gorilla Grodd, King Shark, Hawk Girl, Blue Beetle, Superman, Cheetah, Firestorm, Shazam, Aquaman, Black Lightning, Raven, Power Girl, Black Adam, Mr. Freeze, Killer Moth, Hawkman, Martian Manhunter, Condiment King, Cassie Wonder Girl, and of course, Wonder Woman. Early into the vampire outbreak, Barry Allen was killed, and Wonder Woman really wanted revenge. So she began investigating who could have killed him. And she quickly discovers that it was Hal Jordan. Upon confronting him, Hal's just like, I'm in love with you. So is Barry. So is everyone. And Diana's just like, I, 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 I don't really care. And uses her lasso of truth. Hal reveals that he's a vampire and that he killed Barry. Diana's pretty devastated, but is then hypnotized by Hal, resulting in him infecting her. Now a vampire, Diana and Hal begin going after members of the Justice League, resulting in Superman, Hawkgirl, and various others turning, along with the death of Batman. 
As I mentioned earlier, Cheetah and Cassie Wonder Girl are also infected. Because the story wrapped up earlier this year, I won't go further into detail about the events of the comic. There's still a ton more I didn't talk about. So if you want to learn more, go check it out. The same goes for the six-issue spin-off series, DC vs. Vampires, All Out War, released from September 2022 to February of 2023, and written by Matthew Rosenberg and Alex Packnadel. Paper Man Only appearing in Wonder Woman issue 165, released in October of 1966, Horace Throstle was a victim of workplace harassment. Bullied by pretty much everyone, he was shocked when Diana Prince was nice to him. This one act of kindness caused him to fall in love with her, and in his love-struck state, he fell into a vat of experimental chemicals at the chemical factory he was working as a janitor at. And because this is a comic book, he didn't die. Instead, he became paper-thin. Despite almost dying and now looking like this, his co-workers still continued to bully him. And that's when he decided to become the villain, Paper Man. So he decided to start robbing places to get gifts for Diana. However, Diana wouldn't accept stolen gifts, obviously. And that infuriated him. But how did she know that the gifts were stolen? Well, because when he stole the items, he would have to face off against Wonder Woman. And because of this, he grew to despise her, and just didn't understand that Diana wouldn't accept stolen gifts. So eventually, when he was trying to steal a crown, Wonder Woman blew a gust of wind at him. And this would cause him to fly into a newspaper company nearby, where he would then fall into a printing press, killing him. Everyone was pretty hyped that he died, but Wonder Woman wasn't. For you see, she felt guilty about killing him. Just kidding, she was actually worried that he might still be alive. As for Paper Man's abilities, he's paper thin, so he can disguise himself on various surfaces and slide underneath doors. He can also fold himself into various shapes, like a paper airplane, a wheel, or a kite. And while he hasn't appeared in any pieces of media outside of comics, he has shown up in the Batman Brave and the Bold comic series. Wonder Woman, Diana's Daughter since 2018, DC Black Label has had various great stories released under it. And some pretty poopy ones, but whatever. Anyways, one of the initial Black Label stories revealed to the public has yet to come out. This is Wonder Woman, Diana's Daughter. Written by Greg Rucka, this story would have taken place in a future dystopia. Superheroes are no more after Wonder Woman vanished 20 years ago. But there's still some hope. A young woman discovers that she's Wonder Woman's daughter, and begins to travel the world to discover her mother's whereabouts. The story would never see release, as in 2019, Greg Rucka said in a podcast, quote, I don't have anything on deck with DC at the moment. It looks like the Black Label stuff sort of died away, and that's on me. That's not on them. I just couldn't get Diana's daughter to work right for me. It may be that in, you know, the next six months or so, I'll suddenly figure it out, and then write three scripts, and then send them to Mark Doyle, who will say, well, you're a day late and a dollar short, but let's see what we can do. But beyond that, there's really nothing outstanding. So will we ever see Diana's daughter come out? Probably not. The Heikatea Wonder Woman The Heikatea is a one-shot released in August of 2002, and written by Greg Rucka. The story has Batman and Wonder Woman facing off against each other after a woman named Danielle kills a dude and does the ritual of Heikatea, a ritual that forces Wonder Woman to protect and care for her, but in return, Danielle must do whatever Wonder Woman demands. If either one of them breaks this deal, they'll be killed by some spooky, scary ghosts. Wonder Woman does show up and doesn't really know why she wants protection, but she's willing to do it. Eventually, Batman shows up and it's just like, Diana, that chick murdered four people. And Wonder Woman's like, so what? Ratio. And kicks Batman out of the Themyscira embassy that Danielle is staying at. Wonder Woman later asks Danielle about the situation, and she reveals that she did kill four people. 
But the people she killed were responsible for the death of her sister, who forced her into... Well, I don't know if I can say the word. Uh, take the word constitution and think about a word that rhymes with it, but starts with the letter P. But Danielle runs off, forcing Wonder Woman and Batman to trade blows. Well, trade blows for like five seconds before Wonder Woman easily takes him down. Danielle then releases Diana from the ritual and decides to end her own life. Diana tries to stop her, but fails. Overall, it's a very depressing story. Justice Riders Released in 1997 and written by Chuck Dixon, Justice Riders is an Elseworlds story that basically answers the question, what if the Justice League were cowboys during the Wild West? The story mainly follows Diana Prince, a sheriff working in the town of Paradise. One day, she returns to Paradise after catching some horse thieves, only to discover the entire town burned to the ground. She then declares that she'll get revenge on whoever is responsible, and begins creating a team. We got Wally West, a bouncer living in Diablo Wells, Katar Johnson, a Native American warrior with artificial wings that allows him to fly, Theodore Cord, an inventor, Michael Carter, a con artist, and uh, literally just Martian Manhunter. Together, they become the Justice Riders and set out to take down the villainous Maxwell Lord and his business partner, who just so happens to be a Dominator. On their journey, they battle a steam-powered robot named Lord Havoc and deal with a Pinkerton agent named Guy Gardner. By the end of the story, Diana and her crew take down Maxwell Lord and go on their separate ways. But Theodore Cord tells the story of the Justice Riders to a writer named Clark Kent, who gets the idea to start writing stories about the team, essentially making them Wild West legends. Powerless Superhero In Wonder Woman issue 179, released in December of 1968, Diana is summoned to Themyscira, where her mom tells her, Hey, so we need to head to another dimension for a while in order to recharge her power. Let's go. But Diana refuses, because humanity might need her help. And because she refuses to go with the rest of the Amazons, all of her powers are removed, as is her Wonder Woman costume and her Lasso of Truth. She's then sent back to Man's World as just an ordinary woman. Now, without any powers, Diana would actually still fight crime. As shortly after losing her powers, she met a man named Ai Ching, who taught her a ton of martial arts and skills with weapons. Ai Ching was actually the last surviving member of a monastery in China. These monks believed that magic and science were the exact same thing. They chilled out for a little bit until Dr. Cyber's henchmen attacked them in order to steal their valuables. And he was the lone survivor of the attack. Anyways, he would teach Diana a whole bunch about martial arts, and she would fight crime as Diana Prince. Uh, no, really, she stopped using the name Wonder Woman. Although, the comic wasn't retitled Diana Prince. Instead, the Wonder Woman comic series would often be referred to as The New Wonder Woman or Diana Prince as Wonder Woman. During this time, Diana would mainly use martial arts and weapons during her fight against evil. Some of the adventures she went on during this time included saving Richard Nixon from some assassins, getting transported to another world with Catwoman, and saving a dude who got turned into a frog. Surprisingly, Wonder Woman's time without powers was actually fairly lengthy, from 1968 all the way to 1973. So why did DC remove her powers in the first place? Well, it wasn't DC's idea. Instead, it was Dennis O'Neill and Mike Sakowski's idea. In fact, DC were the ones who actually gave Diana back her powers, because fans of Wonder Woman were really mad at the time. From casual fans to old school fans to feminist fans, nobody was happy with this new take on Wonder Woman. And so, in 1973, Ai Ching was killed off and Diana was given her powers back. Wonder Woman Amazonia Written by William Messner Loebs and released in 1997, Wonder Woman Amazonia is an Elseworlds story about Diana living in an alternate reality where Queen Victoria and her family were killed. 
And so, an American named Jack Planters became the King of England and created an extremely patriarchal society where women have absolutely no rights. Now, why would Jack Planters do this? Well, because Jack Planters is actually Jack the Ripper. So this is basically a story where Wonder Woman battles King Jack the Ripper. Wild stuff. Anyways, Diana is living her best life on Themyscira, when one day Steve Trevor and a bunch of soldiers show up and kill almost all the Amazons. Diana is captured, and the other survivors are enslaved. And so, Diana lives in London, with absolutely no rights. She was even forced to marry Steve Trevor and have his kids. Eventually, Diana would have enough, and become the underground resistance fighter, Wonder Woman. As Wonder Woman, she inspires people to stand up to the king. She also leads a slave revolt, resulting in the deaths of both Steve Trevor and the king. Now that his father is dead, Prince Charles, who's really nice, becomes the king and marries Diana. And the two lead England into a bright future. And yes, this marriage is a reference to Charles and Diana. Real World's Wonder Woman Released in April 2000 and written by Glenn Hansen and Alan Newworth, Real World's Wonder Woman tells the story of Brenda Kelly. She's an actress in a world where there are no superheroes. Instead, Brenda is just an actress playing a superhero in movies. Wonder Woman. Set in the 1940s, she's pretty popular with audiences, but Senator Rudolph is also pretty popular, and he's on an anti-communist crusade that's forcing Hollywood to insert anti-communist messages in their films, including the Wonder Woman films. This is also during the middle of a strike that's affecting the studio, so it's kind of chaos on set. After seeing the anti-communist Wonder Woman films, Senator Rudolph decides to work with the studio and use Brenda to promote him in his election campaign. And she does, doing rallies with him and even doing little plays where she battles the Red Menace. But eventually, various workers start getting fired from the studio for being suspected communists or communist sympathizers. This eventually leads to Brenda witnessing her friend, who was fired for being on a list of socialists for the 1930s and now part of the strikes, being hosed down by police. This is the final straw for her, and during a rally, she turns on Rudolph and tells the people her real thoughts. But while this is going on, a man attempts to assassinate Rudolph, only for Brenda to take the bullet instead. Because of this, she's fired from being Wonder Woman, and she goes on with her life. First time ever, it's the explosive DC Comics Superheroes Live. A show so big, it can only be at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. The largest live-action gathering of America's favorite superheroes. With blockbuster thrill minute excitement, there's nothing like it anywhere. Not even at Disney. It's the all-new DC Comics Superheroes Live. Only at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas in San Antonio. Fireworks Man First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 141, released in October of 1963, Fireworks Man is a very strange entity. Like Mouse Man, he's a member of the Academy of Arch Villains, and we know almost nothing about his backstory. All we know is that he was a villain who really wanted to win a Golden Wonder Woman Award, so he created some chemical formula at a fireworks factory that turned him into a giant monster made out of fireworks. He attempted to take down Wonder Woman, but failed, and actually ended up dying. So, uh, R.I.P. Fireworks Man. As for his powers, he's a being made out of fireworks, so he can change his form whenever he wants. He can also fly and move pretty fast. And fireworks are always constantly flying out of him. There's not really much else to say about him, he dies in his very first appearance, and is an enemy to all dogs. While he hasn't appeared in any pieces of media, he has shown up in the Batman The Brave and the Bold comic series. Rejected Wonder Woman Verse Comic In November of 2021, comic writer and artist Phil Jimenez 
revealed that at one point, he pitched a Wonder Woman multiversal team-up comic to DC. The story would have featured the Golden Age Wonder Woman, the DCAU Wonder Woman, the Linda Carter Wonder Woman, both Donna and Cassie Wonder Girls, and other variations of Wonder Woman teaming up to battle some kind of foe. Sadly, DC rejected the pitch. Rockumentary Rockumentary is a short Elseworld story featured in Elseworld's 80-page Giant, released in August of 1999. In this universe, the heroes and villains of the DC Universe are all musicians. Well, except for Lex Luthor, who runs Lex Records, one of the most successful publishers in the industry, working with iconic musicians like Doomsday and Batman. And of course, there's Diana, who in this universe is one of Lex Records' most successful artists, signing on with Lex Records for millions of dollars. Diana became extremely popular, and with popularity comes being pretty busy. And so, in the story, Diana doesn't show up outside of a single panel, and says nothing, because she's too busy preparing for the Tie Me Down, Tell the Truth world tour. Not much to say here, kinda just wanted to include this short story to show this really insane Wonder Woman design. Novels Marvel and DC superheroes are mostly known for their appearances in comics, video games, movies, cartoons, and live-action shows. However, that doesn't mean there haven't been times these characters have shown up in book form. Wonder Woman, for example, has appeared in various novels over the years. For example, between 2003 and 2004, seven different novels were released. Since then, there's been many other novels, including the Amazing Amazon series, the DC Superhero Adventures, and of course the most famous Wonder Woman novel, Warbringer, written by Lee Bardugo, and released in 2017. This novel even got a graphic novel adaptation. So yeah, while mostly known for comics, movies, etc., Wonder Woman has had many adventures in the world of novels. Wonder Woman 1 Million First appearing in JLA issue 23, released in October of 1998, Wonder Woman 1 Million is an alternate universe version of Wonder Woman that lives on Venus. No really, in this universe the Amazons live on the planet Venus. Created as a marble statue, she was given life by the Goddess of Truth, who was actually Wonder Woman from the 21st century, now a god. This Wonder Woman lives in the 853rd century, and works with Justice Legion A, one of the 24 Justice Legions in the future, and together they protect the universe from evil. Wonder Woman also has her own sidekick, Troy, who is also a marble statue given life. Also, Wonder Woman's name is just Wonder Woman. Yeah, she's not called Diana. As for her powers, Wonder Woman 1 Million is insanely smart and can use a form of artificial telepathy called Headnet. She can also fly, has superhuman speed, stamina, and strength. She's also got Harmony and Charity, a pair of AI-controlled bracelets that create force fields. World War II Wonder Woman Show in the early to mid-2010s, producer Butch Lukic pitched an animated Wonder Woman series set in World War II to Warner Bros. for the DC Universe streaming service. However, Warner Bros. rejected the show for two reasons. The first was that they were already developing a Wonder Woman film set in World War I, and they also didn't think a Wonder Woman project would do all that well. So the show was rejected, and Wonder Woman 2017 came out. And Warner Bros. realized, oh, a Wonder Woman project can be really successful. But they didn't return to this pitch. Instead, greenlighting a sequel and an animated film called Wonder Woman Bloodlines. However, they would eventually return to this idea, as the film Justice Society World War II would incorporate ideas that were planned for this series. Jumpa. First appearing in Sensation Comics issue 6, released in June 1942, Jumpa is a Kanga. Basically, a species of animal that looks like a kangaroo and lives on Themyscira. 
kind of a horse-kangaroo hybrid thing that can also fly for brief periods of time. And while Jumpa and the Kangas live on Themyscira, they're not originally from there. Instead, they come from the planet Nebulasta, where they were brought to Themyscira by an evil alien warrior looking to take over the island. But the alien forces were defeated by Diana, who was only seven at the time. And so the Amazons decided to keep the Kangas, mainly because they were much better mounts than the giant rabbits they were using. Comics in the 1940s were wild, dude. Anyways, Jumpa didn't really appear that much, as did his species, and for quite a while they were pretty much forgotten to time. That was until the 21st century, when I guess writers and artists remembered, oh yeah, there's a bunch of kangaroo aliens that live on Themyscira. And upon remembering them, they've started to show up in a bunch of stuff ranging from the Earth-1 graphic novels, the main DC Universe, DC Super Pets, DC Superhero Girls, Scooby-Doo Team-Up, etc. Honestly, I'm willing to bet they'll show up in the new DCU. Blue Snowman First appearing in Sensation Comics issue 59, released in November of 1946, Berna Brillant was a thief turned supervillain. Originally just a teacher, she had a secret life, where she would pretend to be a man in a robotic snowman suit and called herself the Snowman, though she'd later change up her armor and rename herself the Blue Snowman. She did this to extort people, and she did this by using Blue Sky, I mean Blue Snow. This was a chemical that allowed whoever used it to freeze people. However, her career of villainy caught the attention of the Holiday Girls, who told Wonder Woman all about her, and so Diana showed up and defeated her. But this wasn't the end of the Blue Snowman. She would return, now working with the supervillain group Villainy Inc., and together battled Wonder Woman a few times. However, all of their plans fell through, and she was thrown into a prison on Transformation Island. She would return post-crisis in Power Girl issue 7, released in February of 2010, where she would die in her very first appearance. Rip. Finally, they'd make their return in the post-New 52 universe in Superman Wonder Woman issue 4, released in March 2014. Now gender fluid, they had a bit of an issue with the name Blue Snowman. It turns out, they didn't come up with the name. The press did. They were pretty depressed for years because they thought they were a freak. They didn't know what gender they were. But eventually, they found out about the term gender fluid and realized they weren't a freak. They were just a criminal who's probably killed people before. And so, they gave up their villainous ways. Just kidding, they went back to doing crime pretty soon after. Side notes, in this continuity, they at one point had a kaiju-sized blue snowman mech. As for their powers, while they don't actually have any superpowers, their blue snowman armor does give them superhuman strength and speed alongside various freezing gadgets like freeze rays and defrosting rays. They've also got a bunch of blue snowman robot minions. And the New 52 version of the character has a blue snowman airship. Anyways, as for blue snowman's appearances, they've appeared in Harley Quinn and Justice League Cosmic Chaos. Filmation's Wonder Woman in 1968, the animation studio Filmation were considering creating an animated series based around Wonder Woman. This was due to the success of the show, The Superman Aquaman Hour of Adventure. However, they ultimately decided against the cartoon, along with other potential cartoons, including one based on Metamorpho and Plastic Man. And so, instead of making those shows, they just kept making cartoons based on Batman, Superman, and Aquaman. Sadly, this is all we know about this cancelled cartoon. Dimension X In Wonder Woman issue 100, released in August of 1958, Wonder Woman arrives on Themyscira after telling Steve about how she only uses her powers for truth and justice, not for contests only for her to then partake in a contest on Themyscira to prove she's still worthy of being Wonder Woman. Anyways, after proving her talents, she meets up with Alpha, a scientist on Themyscira, who reveals that she's created a device that can send people to another dimension. 
Dimension X. Diana agrees to be a guinea pig for her and gets sent to Dimension X and sent back. The test is a success, except she's not alone when she returns. The Wonder Woman of Dimension X is also brought over and declares that she's a way better Wonder Woman. So the Amazons hold another contest, this time to see who's the best Wonder Woman. The contest eventually leads the pair to return to Dimension X for some challenges. It turns out this reality is a fairy tale like medieval world, and so their challenge requires them to battle a bunch of fairy tale giants. After battling the giants, it seems that Wonder Woman X is about to win when suddenly Diana saves her from a tree boomerang. Impressed by this act of heroism, the people of Dimension X crown Diana as the Wonder Woman of both realities. Lawrence McCutcheon Lawrence McCutcheon is a former professional American football player that played for the Los Angeles Rams, Denver Broncos, Seattle Seahawks, and the Buffalo Bills. And he has almost nothing to do with Wonder Woman. Almost. You see, he would make a guest appearance in The Deadly Sting, a 1978 episode of the 70s Wonder Woman series. It's a simple guest appearance that caused some behind-the-scenes issues. You see, Lawrence McCutcheon was supposed to be thrown by Wonder Woman in a scene, but he refused to let this happen. So Linda Carter approached him and made a deal. If she could actually throw him in real life, he would let them do it in the show. He agreed, and was eventually forced to be thrown, because Linda Carter actually did it. She threw him on her first attempt. In fact, the creators of the show used the footage of her throwing him in the show. Should also mention here that she didn't, like, pick him up. It was like she grabbed him and, like, threw him into a chair. It, it wasn't like she, like, lifted him up. Still pretty impressive, though. Joss Whedon's Wonder Woman film. In March 2005, it was announced that Joss Whedon would write and direct a live-action Wonder Woman film. Unlike the previous cancelled Wonder Woman films I talked about, we actually know quite a bit about this film's plot, as the script was leaked in 2017. The story would have focused on Diana and Steve Trevor's relationship, with Steve acting as a narrator for the film. When Steve crash lands on Themyscira, Diana and her mother fight each other in order to see if Steve Trevor can live. Eventually, Diana leaves with Steve to Gateway City where she has to face off against a bunch of problems she can't exactly fix, like poverty. The two villains of the film would be Strife and Arabella Callis. The latter was an original villain that I'm pretty sure was based on Veronica Kale. Together, they run the tech company Spearhead and use a robotic chimera to try and destroy the city. Diana is eventually forced to give up her powers to save Steve, and is then banished to South America, though eventually she would return to Gateway and defeat the villains. There were also some really weird elements in the film. For example, there's a scene where Diana does a sensual dance in order to distract some criminals. Also, Steve Trevor is really mean to her throughout the film, even saying this little rant. However, these were all from an early draft of the script, there would be no final script to polish it out. As in February of 2007, Whedon would leave the project before a final script could be completed, due to him not seeing eye to eye with the studio, and there were also disagreements about the film's budget. The final few bits of info we have about this film is that Whedon wanted Angelina Jolie to play Diana, and Evangeline Lilly actually turned down an offer to star in the film. Power Princess? First appearing in Defenders issue 112, released in July of 1982, Zarda Shelton is basically Marvel's attempt at Wonder Woman. No, really. Born on Utopia Island, Zarda met a man named Howard Shelton, who was shipwrecked. And Zarda decided to go with him to see the rest of the world, and to fight the Axis powers, as this was during World War II. Her fellow Utopian people bailed from Earth shortly afterwards due to the creation of atomic weapons. They just got in their spaceship and left. Meanwhile, Zarda would join the superhero group 
Squadron Supreme and take up the mantle of Power Princess. They fought a bunch of crime together, but eventually every single member of the team, except for her and their team leader, Hyperion, were killed. With their world on the brink of destruction, Hyperion convinced Zarda to take a dimensional portal to escape death. And so, she was the sole survivor of her team. She would then meet up with an alternate universe version of herself, named Warrior Woman, who was part of the group Squadron Sinister. Yeah, they were evil. She stole Zarda's power to investigate Earth-616's Squadron Supreme. However, Zarda would actually survive this and end up on Earth-616 as well, and went on to battle her evil counterpart. As for her powers, Zarda has superhuman strength, speed, stamina, and reflexes. She can also fly and has resistance to telepathy. There's also been various other power princesses in the Marvel multiverse. Uh, too many for me to list off here, but just know they're all pretty much just Marvel's Wonder Woman. Blue Amazon Released in September of 2003 and written by Jean-Marc and Randy Lofichier, Wonder Woman Blue Amazon is a one-shot Elseworlds story that's a sequel to the Elseworlds stories Superman's Metropolis and Batman Nosferatu. Together, the three stories make up a trilogy of DC's tribute to German Expressionist cinema, with Blue Amazon being heavily inspired by the films The Blue Angel and Dr. Mabuse the Gambler. The story focuses on an exotic dancer named Diana, who's known as the Blue Amazon. She's lost a lot of her memory, and is imprisoned by this universe's Dr. Psycho who has her working as an exotic dancer while he tries to figure out a way to discover where she's from. It turns out she's from the floating city called Heaven. This city was created by a woman named Paula Van Gunther, who used a bunch of genetic engineering to create a race of beast women. Diana was also created by her, but instead of her being made a beast woman, she's born directly from Paula. Life was going pretty alright in Heaven, until one day, the Beast Women start acting out. Paula realized that she needed some new genes to help them keep them under control. So she sent Diana down to Metropolis to meet with Luthor, this universe's Lex Luthor, in order for him to supply them with new genes. However, Luthor was crazy and had Diana's memories erased. Meanwhile in Heaven, a Beast Woman named Cheetah killed Paula and took control over the Flying City. However, her rule is incomplete, as she needs Diana's DNA in order to create more Beast Women. So she travels down to Metropolis to capture Diana. Meanwhile, Diana befriended a man named Steve Treverson, who tried to rescue her, but was captured by Dr. Psycho, who has also made a deal with Cheetah. If she kills Superman, he'll give her Diana. While she's off doing that, Psycho decides to kill Steve. This causes Diana to become a Wonder Woman, and she saves his life. She then faces off against Cheetah, wins, and Diana is crowned the Queen of Heaven. Dark Multiverse, War of the Gods So Tales of the Dark Multiverse was a series of one-shots that told alternate endings to famous DC storylines. Written by Vita Ayla and released in December of 2020, The War of the Gods issue tells the story of what if the god Hecates was able to successfully possess Wonder Woman. Because in the original storyline, they're defeated by the Lasso of Truth before they can do that. So what would happen if Hecates was successful? Well, in the story, Hecates is about to fail once again, but that's when one of her servants, Phobos, attacks the Mascara and kills a bunch of Diana's loved ones, including her mother. This allows Hecates to take over Diana while she's in an emotional breakdown. Now fully in control, Hecates then rolls into Mount Olympus and slaughters the gods of Olympus, and shortly afterwards declares war on all of Earth's superheroes. However, she wouldn't be fighting this war for very long, as she'd be taken down by a bunch of magic users on Earth. Though in the aftermath of Hecates' onslaught, Superman, Batman, Martian Manhunter, Wally West, Doctor Fate, Shazam, and multiple gods of Olympus like Ares, Zeus, and Hermes are all dead. 
And sadly for Diana, she never comes back, and Hecate, still in her body, is locked away underneath the mascara. The Velvet Touch This is a scrapped episode of the 1975 Wonder Woman series. This episode would have dealt with Diana dealing with a criminal selling toxic makeup. The episode was fully written, but not filmed, due to Linda Carter having an endorsement deal for the makeup company Maybelline. So yeah, the episode didn't happen because of a makeup company. Dr. Domino Only appearing in Wonder Woman issue 205, released in April of 1973, Dr. Domino was an enemy of not just Wonder Woman, but the United Nations. You see, while Diana was working for the United Nations, Dr. Domino and his men infiltrated the United Nations. Turns out, he did this to get to a man named Morgan Tracy, who has access to a bioweapon formula that Domino wants. So he captures Wonder Woman and ties her to a nuclear missile, demanding Tracy hand it over. He refuses, and so the missile is launched. But Diana is able to guide the rocket back over to Tracy and rescue him. And after saving him, the pair jump into the invisible jet and fly away, while the missile is destroyed by Domino's men. And so, shrapnel falls onto their boat, killing them all. The day is saved, but Diana realizes that Tracy is only attracted to Wonder Woman, not Diana Prince. Aw, how sad. Though eventually it turns out that he's the villain Prime Planner, so, oh well. Anyways, as for Dr. Domino's powers, the dude has none. He's literally just a terrorist with a domino for a head. I guess the idea is that he does acts of terror to start a domino effect or something. I don't know, man, this dude kind of sucks. The Twelve Labors So when Diana was given her powers back after her years of fighting crime with Ai Ching, Hippolyta removed all of her memories from the time she had no powers. And uh, one of these memories was the death of Steve Trevor. Kind of a messed up thing to do. So anyways, when she shows up to rejoin the Justice League, she actually refuses to rejoin the team, saying that because she lost some of her memories, she can't rejoin. She then says, in order for her to return to the team, she'll need to do 12 different missions mirroring the 12 labors of Hercules. And during these 12 missions, members of the League would watch over her. This was the 12 labors story arc. Lasting 12 issues, Wonder Woman does a bunch of stuff, including fighting a bioenergy duplicated version of herself, preventing the Amazons and Atlanteans from going to war with each other, battling a space robot, defeating a patriarchal society from another dimension who are kidnapping and brainwashing feminists, stopping a nuclear war from happening, and battling the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, really, the villain Felix Faust uses magic to bring the Statue of Liberty to life for a bit to battle Wonder Woman. Just imagine, Wonder Woman. Released in January of 2002, Just Imagine, Wonder Woman is a one-shot written by Stan Lee. Yes, you heard me right, Stan Lee. The idea behind this story was to let Stan Lee reimagine DC's most popular heroes. He did one for Batman, The Flash, Superman, and others, including Wonder Woman. His version of Wonder Woman is a woman named Maria Mendoza. She lives in Peru and is the daughter of a local judge. Being a judge, he's got a lot of enemies, including a man named Armando Gute, who's excavating a holy site, looking for some powerful ancient runes that would allow him to take over the world. Judge Man doesn't really like this, and so is killed. So in order to get revenge, Maria sneaks into the site with the help of an archaeologist named Steve Trevor, and stumbles upon the runes. There's the Dark Rune, and the Light Rune. The Dark One is already smashed, so she decides to finish up the job and smash the Light Rune. And once she does that, she's given the magical powers of the Incan Sun God. Or I guess a more accurate description would be that she was given a magical staff that gives her the powers whenever she's holding it. Using her newfound powers, she went over to stop Armando, who had destroyed the Dark Rune and now had superpowers of his own. And by superpowers, I mean he turned into this giant monster thing. 
The two battled it out, until eventually Maria straight up impaled him. Now that he's dead, she decides to become a superhero, living in Los Angeles. As for her powers, she has none. However, when she's holding the Golden Staff, she's given superhuman strength and speed, along with the ability to fly. Her staff also has the ability to transform into various things, like a lasso or a shield. JLA, Created Equal Written by Fabian Nicieza and released from March to April 2000, Created Equal is a two-issue Elseworld story that tells the story of what if every single man on Earth died. It's not because of some supervillain or anything like that. Instead, a strange cosmic storm hits the Earth with a plague that kills every single man on the planet. Well, almost all of them. The only two surviving men are Superman, who survived because of his Kryptonian DNA, and Lex Luthor, who survived via his battle armor. So yeah, they're now the only two dudes on Earth. With only women left, the world changes pretty drastically, with Themyscira being elected the capital of the world. Then comes the topic of future generations. Superman and Lois Lane have a kid named Adam, and he's the first of many children created from Superman. So, does Superman get busy with a bunch of women? No. He empties something into a big jar, and for years, people just take from it. Gross. Anyways, Superman comes to the conclusion he might be a carrier of the plague that killed the world's men. So he decides to exile himself from Earth in order to protect his children. Fifteen years go by, and the world is changed yet again, as the Justice League is now entirely made up of women. With Wonder Woman leading the team alongside Power Girl, Supergirl, Starfire, and Batgirl, who's now a Green Lantern. Being an ambassador from Themyscira, Diana often speaks at the United Nations. She basically has to play politics when she's not doing superhero stuff. Also, everyone who's related to Superman has Kryptonian powers. And so, Lex decides to use this to his advantage, and manipulates all of Superman's kids into overthrowing the woman leaders of the world. Superman then returns to Earth, and with the help of Wonder Woman, Lex is defeated. Well, I guess in all fairness, they don't really defeat him. Lex has a stroke mid-fight, so I, I guess they automatically win. Dane of Elysium First appearing in Countdown Presents The Search for Ray Palmer, Superwoman, Batwoman, released in February of 2008, Dane of Elysium, aka Wonder Man, is pretty much what if Wonder Woman was a man, and insane. For years, he acted as a superhero in the world of women, being a part of that universe's Justice League. However, when he killed the gender-bent Maxwell Lord, Maxine Lord, on national television, Dane was banished to his homeland, Elysium, which homed the Amazons of his world, which were all dudes. This really ticked him and the rest of the Amazons off, so they invaded the United States, creating a war between the Amazons and the combined efforts of the U.S. Army, Justice League, Freedom Fighters, and Atlantis. Dude got owned by Superwoman, though, so the war ended. However, this wasn't the last time Dane would show up in the comics. Although, in his future appearances, this would be another Dane. One from a different reality. First appearing in the Multiversity Guidebook, released in March 2015, Dane was a superhero until the rest of the Justice League found out he was planning to overthrow his world's matriarchy. So they threw him into a cell in the Hall of Justice, and for years he was their prisoner. Until one day, he was freed by the Roman god Janus, and decided to take down his former allies and captors. Side note, he at one point was also the mentor for Wondrous Boy, aka Troy. As for Dane's powers, He's got superhuman strength, stamina, healing, and agility. He's also got the Bracelets of Submission and the Lasso of Truth. He could also fly and do super leaps. Taco is... In Wonder Woman issue 73, released in April of 1993, Diana returns to Earth after being abducted for a bit. 
But upon her return, her apartment is gone, now being rented by somebody else. So she crashes with a friend for a bit, and that's when she realizes that she needs money to go rent an apartment. So she goes job hunting. However, for some reason, nobody wants her, despite her being a superhero and her having multiple previous jobs, including jobs working for the government. So eventually, she's forced to get a job at Taco Wiz, aka Taco Bell, but not legally Taco Bell. And so, Diana faces the harsh reality of minimum wage work at a fast food restaurant. Well, there's that, and also the weird customers. For example, there was one dude who ordered an entire plate of tacos and burritos, and just ate the entire tray's worth of food in front of her at the cash register. I've never worked in fast food, but if you have, let me know in the comments below if anyone's ever done this before. Anyways, despite the weird customers, Diana is actually pretty fond of the job. Eventually, other superheroes find out about her new job and actually go and visit her, eating at the place. Eventually, Diana would quit her job and Taco Wiz would be forgotten to time. Get ready. It's coming. An epic event so sweeping, only the Justice League can lead us into it. The Six Flags 45th Anniversary Celebration. This year, explore the new Tava's Jungle Land. Experience ocean discovery. See Shuka's Splash Time Show. Plus, an all-new Bugs Bunny Parade Spectacular. Get your season pass at SixFlags.com. Six Flags Marine World. More than a theme park, it's an experience. The CW Amazon Series In 2012, Warner Bros. and the CW began developing a series titled Amazon. This show was heavily influenced by the idea of Smallville. Basically, it would be a Wonder Woman origin story. While the show had a pilot written, it didn't get much further than that because the CW took interest in the Flash series instead, and fast-tracked that show's creation. So Amazon was basically on the back burner. The CEO of the CW at the time confirmed that the show was still going to get made, they just needed to make some better scripts. The show was in production hell until 2016, when Wonder Woman appeared in the DCEU. And this pretty much marked the end of the series, as DC and Warner Bros. were no longer interested in a Wonder Woman story set on the small screen. As for the show's plot, we don't really know anything about it, outside of it being about Wonder Woman's origin story, and it would have taken place in the Arrowverse. Also, it was reported that Amy Manson was being looked at to play Diana. The Watergate Baby the Watergate Baby is another cancelled Wonder Woman 1975 episode. It was fully written, but never filmed. I can't even find information about what the episode would have been about. Though I think the title of the episode is probably a hint. This episode would have come out a few years after the Watergate scandal, so that probably has something to do with why the episode was scrapped. The Crimson Centipede First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 169, released in April of 1967, the Crimson Centipede is an abomination created by Ares. Why did he create this horrible thing? Well, because Aphrodite was like, Wonder Woman's so cool, you couldn't create anything that could beat her. So Ares sent him off to Earth, where he faced off against Wonder Woman after battling waves of police and robbing banks and Wonder Woman was actually defeated by the Crimson Centipede. But this was only because she was taken by surprise. So she tries again, and fails again. Seems that Crimson Centipede is pretty tough, but in her third battle with the Abomination, she was actually able to defeat it by tricking the creature into removing her bracelets. Little did this freak know that those bracelets held back her power. Now that she was all charged up, Diana beats the crap out of him, finally ending his robbery spree. As for the Crimson Centipede's powers, he's got super strength and speed. He can also climb buildings and has eight pistols. 
Crimson Centipede would shockingly return in the post-New 52 world in Wonder Woman Steve Trevor special, released in August of 2017, in which a bunch of MGTOWs broke into Star Labs so they could steal some chemicals, only to accidentally discover this giant xenomorph centipede that was created by Star Labs. Wonder Woman would then show up and defeat him. While the Crimson Centipede hasn't appeared in anything outside of comics, he has shown up in the Batman the Brave and the Bold comic series. 1999 NBC Wonder Woman Live Action Series Due to the success of the series Lois and Clark The Adventures of Superman, in 1999 one of the show's producers, Deborah Joy Levine, pitched another superhero show to NBC. This show would be about Wonder Woman, but instead of being about her fighting villains, it would be about Diana trying to juggle her personal life and love life with her superhero life. Diana would have also been a Greek history professor, and the show would have been set in the same continuity as Lois and Clark, which would open up the possibility of crossover episodes. However, this show wouldn't be picked up, Although, Wonder Woman still exists in the Lois and Clark continuity. As in that show, Diana is briefly mentioned on a news broadcast. Wonder Woman's Twin In Wonder Woman issue 46, released in April of 1951, Wonder Woman gets gaslit. One day, Diana is just chilling at work, when Steve walks in and introduces her to Joanne Lane, a new employee. And when he leaves, Joanne lets Diane on a little secret. She's Wonder Woman. Diana's obviously not buying it, so Joanne decides to prove herself. She almost instantly changes into Wonder Woman's gear and climbs into the invisible jet. Diana's pretty confused. However, she quickly pieces it together. That wasn't the invisible jet she climbed into. She just climbed onto the roof of the building. Convinced that she's faking her abilities, Diana runs off to find her, and eventually finds her on a boat carrying some criminals. But that's when Joanne calls Diana Joanne. Diana's pretty confused, and soon gets captured by the villain Professor Jenkel. And when she wakes up, she's sitting next to another Wonder Woman, who tells her that her name is Inez Lane. Turns out, she's the twin sister of Joanne, and the two were hired by Jenkel to pose as Wonder Woman. You see, Jenkel hired the twins when he pretended to be a movie producer, and he told the pair that in order for them to play Wonder Woman in his new movie he was making, they would need to act out the script in real life. That's why Joanne started working at the place Diana works. This would draw out the real Wonder Woman, which would allow Jenkel to capture her. And right after Jenkel explains his plan, he's almost instantly taken out by both Wonder Woman. When Diana returns to work, she finds Steve making out with Joanne. Although, he's only kissing her to compare her kiss with Wonder Woman's kiss. And because of the results, he refuses to believe Joanne is Wonder Woman. Classic 1950s storytelling. The Empress of the Silver Snake. In Wonder Woman issue 252, released in February of 1979, Wonder Woman faces off against her aunt, Astarte. You see, a long time ago, Astarte was killed by Hercules, but instead of her spirit joining the afterlife, it instead traveled into space, where it eventually landed on an asteroid. And on that asteroid, she would create a robotic body out of the gold and silver in the asteroid to host her spirit. She then created a big old snake out of silver. Now traveling around space in a giant snake, she began calling herself the Empress of the Silver Snake. She also had absolutely no memory of dying. Upon meeting Diana, she believed her to be an evil spirit, and so fought her. However, upon realizing that Diana wasn't an evil spirit, and instead human, she literally froze up and stopped fighting. Realizing her connection to the Amazons, Diana would bring in Hippolyta and some other Amazons to investigate the Empress. Astarte would then spring back to life and battle the Amazons, until Hippolyta explains to the Empress that she molded Diana to look like Astarte in her honor, and that she was also dead. This somehow finally reminded Astarte of what happened to her, 
and just like that, her robotic body fell apart and her spirit finally entered the afterlife. Wanda First appearing in Tangent Comics Wonder Woman, released in September of 1998, Wanda is an alien from the planet Gotham and is the Wonder Woman of Earth-9. On her world, her species discovered a way to stop aging. However, it had some pretty strange side effects, as the males of the species would become hyper-aggressive brutes, while the women of the species developed powers. Not a very fair trade-off, so a civil war broke out. During the civil war, a woman named Lena wished to end the war, so she created Wanda. She was given a bunch of powers and extreme intelligence, and with these gifts, she was to end the Civil War as an example of what the two sides could be if they stopped fighting. And she did. Both sides stopped fighting, only for them to join forces to try to kill Wanda for being an abomination. This obviously forced her to leave Gotham, and she would eventually crash land on Earth, where she'd be found by a reporter named Lori. And when she asked who she was, Wanda responded, Wonder Woman. And so, Wanda became a superhero on Earth, with her first job as a superhero being taking down two Gotham assassins who landed on Earth with a mission to take her out. After defeating the pair, she would continue fighting crime as Wonder Woman, even joining her universe's Justice League. As for her powers, Wanda has telekinesis, telepathy, superhuman strength, enhanced senses, and she can sense others' emotions. She also has a ton of skills using bladed weapons. The Brady Kids The Brady Kids is a short-lived animated spin-off to the sitcom The Brady Bunch. Lasting from September of 1972 to October of 1973, the show lasted for 22 episodes and is notable for having crossovers with DC Comics. And one of the three DC characters to cross over with the show was Wonder Woman, voiced by Jane Webb. She appears in the episode, It's All Greek to Me, where she and the Brady family get magically transported to ancient Greece. It's a pretty weird crossover, made even weirder when you realize this episode marks the very first appearance of Wonder Woman on television and animation. So this forgotten crossover is weirdly pretty significant for the character. Turu only appearing in Wonder Woman issue 106, released in May of 1959, Turu is a giant from the planet, Planet G. And Planet G has its own Olympics, and Turu wins. He's allowed one prize, and so he tells the judges he wants his prize to be the planet Earth. But the judges tell him that he can only have Earth if he defeats Wonder Woman. So Turu sets off to defeat Wonder Woman. But before he does, his wife asks him to bring her home a gift. So when he arrives on Earth, he decides to create a giant charm bracelet for his wife. Wonder Woman then shows up to stop him, but ends up being captured alongside Steve Trevor. This is because it's June 19th, and on June 19th every year at 10 o'clock, she loses her powers for the rest of the day. And this bit of lore is never mentioned again. Anyways, Turu brings them back to Planet G as gifts for his wife, but by the time he returns, Wonder Woman's powers are back, so she challenges him to some Olympic Games. He's forced to accept and faces off against her in three challenges. Giant unicorn hunting, bird catching, and arrow finding. And despite her size, Diana manages to win the contest and takes Planet G as her own. She then tells all the giants to stop being mean and flies back to Earth. The Once and Future League Released in July of 1994 and written by Dan Vado, The Once and Future League is an Elseworld story that takes place in a reality where the villain Felix Faust kills the entire Justice League and takes over the world. Well, the entire Justice League except for Martian Manhunter. A hundred years after his rule, the sole surviving member of the Justice League, Martian Manhunter, creates a rebel group to take down Felix and free the planet from his evil rule. 
he finds six worthy candidates to take up the mantles of his fallen friends. Superman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Batman, Hawkman, and Red Tornado. However, Felix knows about his plans to create a resistance, and is able to convince a member of the new Justice League to join him. Superman? The team goes on a few missions together without knowing that Superman is actually evil. Although, he might not be as evil as Felix wanted him to be. As during a mission to stop a city from being destroyed, Superman actually saves the city, claiming that too many lives would be lost if he let it get destroyed. But he's perfectly fine with betraying the team in their next outing. After betraying the team, Martian Manhunter reveals his powers, and a big old fight ensues. The fight ends when Felix Faust attempts to do a spell that'll kill all the heroes. However, it doesn't work, and the souls of the original Justice League show up and kill him. And uh, with that, the day is saved. As for this future Wonder Woman who's part of the team, she has most of Wonder Woman's abilities, and is wearing a costume very similar to hers with the main difference being that she's wearing thigh-high black boots. Wonder Tot First appearing in Wonder Woman issue 124, released in August of 1961, Wonder Tot is literally just Wonder Woman from the past when she was a toddler. And through some time travel shenanigans, she was able to meet the modern-day Wonder Woman. Basically, she was Wonder Woman as a toddler, fighting bad guys and going on adventures and sometimes she was partnered up with other variants of Wonder Woman as the short-lived superhero group Wonder Woman Family. However, after a while, DC decided to stop using her, as fans of the comics weren't a fan of her. Which, I mean, fair enough. I mean, she's literally just Wonder Woman but a toddler. But you know what the craziest thing about all of this is? In Wonder Woman issue 158, released in November of 1965, DC writer Robert Knier appears in the story and summons the entire Wonder Woman family and some of their related characters to his office, where he tells them that Wonder Tot and various other characters will be retired. I wish Marvel and DC would do this whenever they retire characters, it's just such a weird idea. Wade Dazzle only appearing in Wonder Woman issue 222, released in March of 1976, Wade Dazzle is one of the many villains Wonder Woman has to face off against during the Twelve Labors storyline. Although, technically Diana doesn't actually fight him. You see, Wade Dazzle was a cartoonist who created the popular characters Jerry Gerbil and Harriet Hamster. These characters became so popular, he created an entire theme park based on the characters, called Dazzle Land. However, he died. Well, that was the official story. In actuality, Wade Dazzle faked his death, and hooked himself up to a device underneath Dazzle Land that allowed him to siphon bioenergy from park guests. This bioenergy would, in theory, give him immortality but it didn't work and he died. And you've probably guessed it already, but yes, Wade Dazzle is an obvious parody of Walt Disney. Anyways, the bioenergy taken from the park guests has actually created a duplicate of Wade Dazzle. And this duplicate creates a bioenergy duplicate of Wonder Woman in order to capture Wonder Woman so he can use her as a source of infinite bioenergy. He also creates multiple duplicates of Wade Dazzle's characters, Harriet and Jerry. However, all the duplicates are killed via acid, and the day is saved. As for his powers, he has none. He's a corpse. But his creations had the technology to steal bioenergy from people. They were also armed with guns. Although, these guns weren't exactly very effective. Matthew Jennison and Brent Strickland's Wonder Woman film. Right before Joss Whedon left his Wonder Woman project, Warner Bros. purchased a spec script for a Wonder Woman film written by Matthew Jennison and Brent Strickland. This script impressed the executives at Warner Bros. and Silver Pictures, and was about Wonder Woman fighting in World War II. Set in 1943, the film would feature Steve Trevor crashing on Themyscira, 
after taking pictures of secret German blueprints. Hippolyta and the Amazons aren't really big fans of him being there, and so sentence him to death. But Diana likes him, so the pair escape in the invisible jet. The two team up and travel to Berlin to battle the Germans, before returning to Themyscira to help fend off a giant fleet of German bombers. Despite the studios liking the script, the fact that the film was set in World War II is actually what killed the project, because producer Joel Silver didn't want to make a period piece. So the script was rejected. However, because the studios were impressed with the script, Strickland and Jennison were hired to write another script in April of 2008. This script would take place in modern day and explore the history of Themyscira. And uh, that's literally all we know about it. Space Dinosaurs In Wonder Woman issue 105, released in April of 1959, Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor investigate some missing space rockets. You see, a bunch of space rockets have been going missing, and the most recent missing rocket sent back a picture of a pteranodon flying in space. Steve flies off in a rocket, while Wonder Woman follows him in the invisible jet. And shortly after leaving Earth, they come face to face with a giant flying pteranodon. The pteranodon captures the pair and flies them to Titan, one of Saturn's moons. And once they arrive on the moon, they discover the planet is inhabited by dinosaurs and other prehistoric life, like plesiosaurs and pteranodons. Not only that, but cavemen as well. Eventually, a T-Rex captures Steve, which leads to Wonder Woman having to save him from being devoured by the T-Rex's babies. Now reunited, Wonder Woman decides to help the cavemen and builds a giant wall to keep the dinosaurs out of their territory. Diana then telepathically gives information about the 1950s to the cavemen, in hopes that they'll start creating technology. Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor then leave Titan, and the dinosaurs and cavemen of Titan are literally never mentioned again. The Unremembered Released in December of 1996 and written by John Bryan, The Unremembered is an Elseworlds story that tells the story of a spaceship in the far future. Inside the spaceship is a woman named Elixa. She was originally part of a civilization in the ship called the Unremembered. They're the last remnants of humanity. They were all born on the ship, and it's been so long since the ship began flight that nobody remembers who built the ship or why they're even in it. The ship is filled with weird abominations, mutants that want to devour the Unremembered. These are the creatures of the shadows, and the Unremembered are constantly fighting them. Most of the Unremembered are pretty okay with not knowing their history, but Elixa is very curious about the past, and so she leaves her community to explore the ship. She eventually comes across a monster known as a Rat Bat using a computer. This is pretty weird to her because these creatures aren't supposed to be sentient. But then, she's hit with visions and memories of a woman named Wonder Woman, a hero from the past. She then accesses the same computer and is hit with even more visions of the past. She basically relives Wonder Woman's entire life. She then sees a colony of rat bats, and it turns out, they're all sentient, and they're not monsters. They have their own culture and customs. Meanwhile, the Unremembered launch an attack on the Ratbat Hive, only to be met by the Ratbat Elixa had seen before, now wearing a Wonder Woman costume. Before any more lives can be lost, Elixa arrives and stops the fighting, declaring that the Ratbats are friends. And so, the two societies mesh together and become one big happy society. Island of Dr. Moreau JLA, Island of Dr. Moreau, is an Elseworlds story released in September of 2002 and written by Roy Thomas. Heavily influenced by the original 1896 novel by H.G. Wells, the story is about a dude named Lucas Carr. He's lost at sea and is rescued by a man named Edward Ivo and his friend Komodo. Lucas is pretty thankful for the rescue, but notices that Komodo is a scaly 
Eventually, he meets Captain Davis, the captain of the ship they're on, and he's not a fan of all the animals that Edward and Komodo are hauling. But he quickly forgets about Captain Davis, as they've arrived at their destination, and are met by Dr. Moreau and his crew of furries. I hate the dolphin one, it just, I hate the way it looks. Anyways, some of these animals are Bernardus, who has an arm made out of electric eels that generates electricity, Jubitus, who has super speed powers, Delphinius, who can swim pretty well, and Diana, who is super strong. Lucas is taken in by Dr. Moreau, and that's when he remembers reading about this dude. Turns out, Dr. Moreau was wanted by authorities for cruel and horrifying experiments. And these experiments led to the creation of these furries. Turns out that Edward Ivo is also in on this. And the pair are using the animals Edward brought over to create more human-animal hybrids. Lucas is horrified by what they're doing and investigates the Furry League. And that's when he discovers they're all sentient and can speak English. They even got their own laws and are pretty strict about following them. Soon enough, the animal people, both Doctors and Lucas, head back to the mainland to show the world that these animals can be used as humanity's servants and their protectors. But nobody's buying it. So Moreau declares that he'll have the creatures catch Jack the Ripper in order to earn the respect of the people. And they do. Except Jack the Ripper is not what they thought. Turns out, he's an orangutan-human hybrid created by Dr. Moreau. He asks the Justice Animals to join him, but Diana just instantly kills him. But that's when she and the rest of her companions first taste blood. This creates tension in the group, and eventually a civil war breaks out between the animals. One side is loyal to Dr. Moreau, while the other side wants to rule for themselves and be free. They fight each other until eventually they all kill each other. With all of them dead, Lucas burns all of Dr. Moreau's research, making sure nobody can create these beasts ever again. Not a very uplifting story, but the original novel isn't very happy either, so... Side note, Dr. Moreau is very fond of Diana. Very fond, if you catch my drift. At least that's the implication I got. Real Worlds, Justice League of America. Released in January of 2000 and written by Mike Carlin, is an Elseworld story set in Chicago in 1999. As a kid, Michael Riley and his friends would pretend to be superheroes. He would pretend to be Superman while his friend Nick was Elongated Man, Karen was Wonder Woman, and Richard was Batman. They always have fun playing, but eventually stop as they get older. However, in October of 1999, they all receive superhero costumes in the mail, with invitations to a Halloween party hosted by a billionaire named Bernard Epstein. Oh, uh, anyways, they all arrive at his party and have a pretty good time. They also find a letter saying that the Sparrow is going to take over the world, uh, but they don't really care. In the morning, the four are abandoned in Chicago where they discover that a superhero-themed restaurant is opening up. They go to investigate and discover they're part of some weird play. After dealing with a bunch of actors in costumes pretending to be comic book villains, the four discover a Halloween parade, which eventually leads them all into meeting the mastermind behind it all. Despero? Well, not really. It's actually Epstein- I'm, I'm gonna call him Bernie, I'm just gonna call him Bernie. It's actually Bernie who reveals his ultimate goal was to bring his childhood friends together to play pretend one more time. And they agree. The story ends with Epstein putting on an Adam costume and shouting out about how he wants to pretend to be a 10-year-old. This comic did not age well in the slightest. The R Word of Wonder Woman in 1993, Mark Miller wrote a 22-page script for a story called The R-Word of Wonder Woman. And it was literally a 22-page R-Word scene. Miller has said that this was just a joke he created, but apparently he did pitch it to DC. And DC was actually considering publishing the story and had apparently had an artist sketch the comic's first page. 
The only reason DC was interested in this story was because, at the time, they were trying to explore the weaknesses of their heroes. So you know, Batman had his back broken, Superman died, and Wonder Woman would be R-worded. Yeah, this comic is not only really messed up, but it's also just like a genuinely terrible idea for a story. Luckily, the comic was cancelled after DC writers and artists began complaining about it. And alright guys, that's it. That's the Wonder Woman Iceberg. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, I'm going to be real with you. This is going to be a very short outro because I am exhausted. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just really tired of uh, working on this. Uh, I mean, it was a fun, I mean, it was fun research and all that, but like editing and especially the writing part and the voice act, like just like the voiceover is just, it's, it, it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's my least favorite part about the uh, thing. Actually, editing is not bad. It's the voiceovers that, uh, I really hate doing, but yeah, uh, hope you guys enjoyed, uh, leave a comment below, you know, what's your favorite Wonder Woman, uh, character, what's, uh, story, do you like Wonder Woman 84, uh, you know, what's, uh, what are, you, are you hoping that Gal Gadot continues to play Wonder Woman in the DC, uh, you? Probably, she probably won't, but I don't know. We'll see what happens, I guess. But, uh, yeah, uh, with all that being said, have a good one, guys. Stay safe. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Uh, stay tuned for, uh, that, I guess. <laughs> all right, see ya. I just got Wonder Woman! Golden Armor! I just got...